All right, boys, we got an epic pod. First one of the year with our boy, Dr. Jelly Roll. Before we get into it, this episode is sponsored by Prize Picks. Boys, I've fired on so many different apps when it comes to sports, and Prize Picks is by far the best app, no question, hands down. Instead of choosing teams, you're choosing individual players. So each player has a set projection, and you either go more or less than that set projection. So if you guys know what players are going to perform on what nights, and you're smart with sports, trust me, it's a no-brainer. You've got to download the Prize Picks app and try it out. For first-time users, we got a code here for you guys to take advantage of. Code NELK, that's a 100% deposit bonus. So plug that in. If you put in 100 bucks, you're gonna get matched 100 bucks. So that, that code's for you boys. Take advantage of that code. Prize picks is available in 70% of the United States, boys. California, Texas, Florida. Trust me, give it a try. Download the Prize picks app. Use code NELK. Let's get into the pod. Loaded onto the scene. And in the industry, we use a term called lightning in a bottle when you have magic, and Happy Dad is definitely lightning in the bottle. It's magic. Officially, like, you know, partnered up with Happy Dad. Yeah. I believe in that brand. They're doing great things. Here's the logo. We got these limited edition Death Row Record Great Flavor Avatar. New Happy Dad and Death Row Records flavor is great. And now, it's officially in stores. I, yeah, remember what the people say, anything. Justin the Highlight Gaethje and Happy Dad Seltzer in the same camp. Ain't believe in the kid, never seen what I did. Going up west side with my Happy Dad. Shout out Snoop. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, Toast to success party. and nothing less. Yes, sir. To a room full of happy dads. <laughs> happy dads. Yo. Go get it, man. What you waiting on? You sitting up here looking at me, listening to him. Go get your order on, man. It's live. I hate this part. It's the worst part, right? It's only in there for like a second, though. It's already done. And Are that fast, it's over. How many times do you get IVs in a month? Uh, If I'm on tour? Yeah, I'm sure. I could say probably nine. Nine to twelve. Really. Yeah, I mean, eight, eight to twelve. You, can, you can't have more than three in there. I'll do like week. two or three a week on tour yeah. because I'll do five or six shows a week. I'm like old school rock and roll, so like I'll take Monday and Wednesday off. I'll play Tuesday, Friday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Friday Saturday, yeah. Sunday. Mm -hmm. So you you know I run. I'm a big dude, drink a lot, run myself in the ground. So I'm always big on this. My bad. I'm just getting fucking. No, you're plugged. Here. Oh, did you? Oh, you missed or you plugged? I think it was my fault though. I think I moved. Yo, congrats, uh, it sucks. It sucks when you have to give it another try. Right. It's like shit. Why? The, the third poke's the one for me though. It's like because I'm like a three strikes you're out guy. I got pussy veins. I think a little bit yeah. sometimes. So they you probably have... hit them a lot though, right? How much you get IV? It depends. Same shit. If I'm traveling around a lot, I'll try to get them as much as I can. But I don't know. I'd say maybe once every two weeks. Yeah, they make a huge difference in my life, man. It's a, I'm it's big. A cheat code. It's a cheat code, man. Cheat when code. did you start getting into like the health shit? Well, like, I'm just now really getting into the health shit. But I got into the IV shit because of my drinking right. years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got into the IV shit, and then I realized the healthy benefits of it, that you could do it not just – I thought it was just a hangover cure. I had no clue that it was, like, jet lag or, like, you know, just little shit. Like, flying Everything. in them planes will dehydrate. You fly twice in a day, man. I, know, I don't care right? how much water you drink. It'll fuck your shit up. You know what I mean? So you were getting them as a hangover cure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, because I was just tying one on too much. And, I, dude, I get them, like – I get those – I'm one of them dudes that when I puke, the neighbors know – you know oh, what I'm yeah. talking about? Like, oh, I'm yeah. one of those guys. Like, I'm a violent puker. Like, what puking about when on, you shit? Puking on the lawn and Are you shit? close sometimes? Depends on what I <laughs> am. I feel like when you shit, they know, too. No? Yeah, if I shit about like you would think a fat person shits. You know how you look at fat people and assume they shit different? It's true. You know that's the truth. No, Are you yeah. going to look me in my ass and tell me you never looked at a fat person and thought, I bet mean, that's a nasty shit? Yeah, never. It is. A it's a nasty shit. shit. No, that's yeah, time is confirmed. Yeah, it's 100%. Yeah, Gabe, it 100%. Yeah. It's all the way in. Gabe, yeah, that, that's a nasty one, too. <laughs> yeah. what, what age did you start drinking at? Fuck, dude. Probably. I've, that's why I want to do this podcast. Nobody's ever asked me that. I think probably 13 or 14. My father was a big drinker, so like I just thought my daddy would pour vodka in his coffee thermos really? at five in the morning. I just thought that was like, I thought it was a sweetener when I was probably 10. You know what <laughs> I'm saying? It's fuck, I might have drank sooner thinking it was sweet and low. 
That's awesome. <laughs> Bob Gooden was there in his car. Yeah. You remember them? They're famous again. I was joking with my daughter about that. I got a 15 year old daughter. So it's like I'm watching life come in full circle. And she's like, the, the trend at her school this year was them big thermoses, the Stanley mugs. Yeah, those are fucking huge right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, dude, that was a big thing when I was, you know, in the eight, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Chicks love those. Yeah. Shoes, it's crazy. They're a thing, right? You Why know what I mean? so, in, like, hot right now. I don't know how they, dude, it all comes back, man. Yeah. It's crazy. crazy. You know what I mean? It's well, just, saw that last night. Yeah, it always comes back. But I, I, I realized back when I was a kid, my father would pour vodka in his coffee right then and there. You know what I mean? How different, uh, your daughter's childhood from yours dude dramatic yeah. man it's 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 really cool i think that's all we really want none of y'all are fathers right if i remember no, right no um so the coolest thing about a kid is like the ability one watching her find her own identity and everything was like but knowing that i'm truly breaking generational curses like genuinely i'm going to break Curses that have been in my family since three, four generations ago, hundreds of years almost of living a certain way and us being able to break that cycle. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously your childhood was pretty, like from what I've seen, obviously, like I, we watch interviews and you talk about how you got incarcerated at 15, 16. Yes, sir. So what do you learn from that? And what, why do you think you were in that situation to even have to do the things you did? You know, I'm not sure that I really had to do it when you look back. But when you're 15, it's do or die, right? Like, as an almost 40-year-old man, I can tell you the shit that you think matters don't really matter. The shit that you think is going to be like seven chapters in your book won't even make it. But at 15, you don't realize that. No. So everything is the complete end of the world. And that's why I'm such a big advocate about giving back to youth and talking to at-risk youth and talking to these kids because I remember how big life was at 15, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? It's like at now at almost 40, I can tell you that we are tiny and life is quick. You know what I mean? But at 15, everything was a different thing. So, but to answer your question, you know, we were, we were middle, lower class people, man. All I, I didn't, I never, I thought about this the other day and I want to hear y'all's story because it could be the same or different, but I didn't grow up next to anybody with a career. Like there wasn't a nurse on my street. There wasn't a mailman on my street. You know, there wasn't even like a hard working construction. We had like maybe one construction worker dude. You know what I mean? Like everybody else was just like barely scraping by. You know what I mean? Like what, what kind of jobs were they doing? Like, if anything, the they might store, work in like, like a Taco Bell. You know what I mean? Like at best fast food. Like I knew somebody, a mother with a fast like food a job. Firm, firm job. Like For like sure. Like a lot of government way. assistance stuff. A lot of like. Just like, you know, come and go. Every, whatever job they had, you just were waiting for the next one. Nobody had like a career career. Uh -huh. Nobody came in with an actual skill set. We didn't have a barber. You know what I mean? So like my only examples of people that were successful were the guys that were selling drugs. Mm. You know, and that don't make it right, but that is just to paint a perspective. Once again, back when you're 12 and you haven't met, I don't know, you, I don't know if any of y'all grew up next to a nurse, but I don't know how different that would be even just for my daughter to think she grows up next to people that work. And have had a job or have went to college or, you know what I mean? These We didn't know nobody went to college. I mean, yeah, if, if all the people that are successful around you, you're going to kind of look to them and, yo, this is what I need to do to be successful, right? Like, you're kind of just a product of your own environment, right? Uh, yeah, it's like, did how many brothers and sisters you got? I got one sister younger. Did she graduate? Yes. Did you, you graduate high school as well? Yeah, high school, yeah. not. Did you graduate school. high school, Stanley? Yeah, yeah. What about you? You graduated graduate high school? school yeah. It wasn't even like a thing in our house. Like, if you did or didn't, it didn't really matter. It was never like... Even something that small, when you think about just cultural differences of learning, is that nobody in the house like you have like put an emphasis on like you got to get your you got to get your diploma. Like I didn't even know nobody in the neighborhood who graduated. I just assumed everybody went and got their GED when they were fifteen or sixteen or seventeen yeah. or whatever the state law was. Like I didn't even like the idea of walking and getting a a hat and throwing it in the air was not even a thought in my mind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like watching my daughter go to high school, Cal. It's been the coolest experience of my whole life. Yeah. Just because you never really saw that. I'm seeing them like they had the state championship football game the other day, Bubba. That's huge in the South. I don't know what y'all know about like Southern. No, yeah. I mean, I'm from Canada. You're, yeah. but when I come here now and see how crazy football is, even yeah, high yeah. school, college. It's a big deal. State championships like a big deal. And it's in this little town called Chattanooga. That's just the coolest town on earth. Y'all should go to Chattanooga. Happy dad would be a big hit there. 
sure it is. But um, we went out there with her, and it was like watching her go to her high school. She goes to this country ass back road high school. They have a bring a tractor to work day. It's like That's she's sick. a part of the farm union thing at school or whatever the farm club is. You know what I mean? Future farmers of America shit. It's like old school country stuff, you know? And going and watching that was like, man, this is every every memory I wish I had, you know? That's kind of cool that you get to kind of live that out now through her. It's really cool, man. And it's really cool to see her doing the right thing and just watching her become a young woman, like her making her own decisions, her own life. It's just really cool, man. I got a seven-year-old, too, so a little boy, so I split That's the awesome. difference. But my 15-year-old, my wife and I have had custody of for eight years. That's awesome. So the first time you went to jail, was that 16, you said? really probably 13 13 i think i went for like a shoplifting case or something and then i caught a weed charge and a couple of salt cases at school i was just in tr- i was just a troubled kid i just i was um it's it's talking about it now so different because you look back with real perspective and work and you're like man i was just not even misunderstood i was i was painfully insecure and felt painfully rejected and I carried a chip on my shoulder and a sense of entitlement in life that I didn't even, I didn't have a reason to have really, you know, but that's the truth. I was just a young, angry kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can start me anytime, baby. You know me, I'll talk and let you poke. I oh, mean, can you talk about the, that first significant charge you got the armed robbery? Yeah, man, that's, um, the armed robbery case. The one that really got me was we were going to, I've never, I don't know if I've ever really talked about this and I've, Try not to, but I fuck, I will. We were going to do a drug deal, not a big one, but some weed. I, I, I don't know, dude. I was fifteen or something. It's like we were sixteen. So what, you guys were just selling weed. Or we were, were going to buy. Somebody too? said they had some weed for no. Somebody said they had some money, and we acted like we had the weed. Okay. So we were going to do that. That was kind of where we were. You know what I mean? And um, and and we went in with bad intentions. That's the truth. And I don't run from that in my story because I think it's really important to own it. I've made peace with it with myself. You know what I'm saying? But it still doesn't make it any right. It was it was a very heinous action. It was a very bad way to live. You know, the thought process going in there was un- inexcusable by any merit. But that's the truth of the story. You know, we were kids, and uh, they charged me as an adult for that one. That was the one I got charged as an adult for. And how much time did you do? <sighs> Dude, I don't. At that time, a few years, I guess. I don't. I, I, so I've been in and out of the system since I was 13 or 14. Right. So from 14 to like 24, 25 for me is a little blurry because you were just always in or out of jail and wow. way more time in than out. So I look at it like I might have did eight and a half of those of that decade. Yeah. Eight years of that decade incarcerated is probably the easiest way and to look how at it. how fucked, like how, how fucked were the jails when you went there? Oh, dude, it was, you know, jail sucks, dude. I've only been for fucking like a few, like 12 hours or 24 hours twice. Yeah. And that was enough for me to be like, bro. No, dude, jail is awful. It is my biggest fear yeah. going to jail, bro. I used to joke with people, and um, I used to joke with people, and and all the time, like dudes in prison would be like, "I just left this camp." They call it camp, or I just left here, and they'd be like, "It was all right. The food was good." Like, like we were talking about malls. I was like, "We're not talking about fucking malls here, dude. I don't care if they give me a fillet in one spot. It's fucking my freedom missing." Yeah. You know what I mean? The way I describe it is my absolute best day. Best day, the best day I ever had in jail was my birthday one year. I'll never forget it. It was just an awesome day to be in for 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 jail. Was what better was than my worst day I've ever had out here. The single worst day of my life I've had homeless, thinking I wasn't going to figure it out in life, thinking suicidal thoughts out here were never worse. Were never worse than my best day in jail. Yeah, jail fucked, bro. And at that point, when you're in and out, music wasn't a part of your life. Music was, but just like from the therapeutic side of like writing it. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I've always wrote songs like music was a really big, big thing in my household. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like what was y'all's relationship with music growing up? Dude, my Rolling Stones my whole life. Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, like classic rock. Like, but your parents like played music for you? Yeah, they played that. My dad played 70s. My mom played 80s. Dope. So what about play. you? Like, I mean, my, your dad's, parents, my dad's a big like classic rock guy. Dope, yeah. dope. So he'd like like made it a point to introduce you to music, yeah, kind yeah, of for sure. What about I mean, you? Mine's old old R and B. Like I mean, James Brown is big. Um, just old just old music. Who do you remember like introducing you to music like the most? Probably my dad. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's I awesome. I said the radio, man. Really? 
honestly. Yeah, that's cool. I don't know, the radio was on, and I didn't know how to change it, so like, yeah, we just kept playing, and then there was some there were some good songs throughout the day. Yeah, but I didn't know how to change it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I grew up like similar to y'all too. Like we had a real like bang music household. Like we would all gather around the speakers, like more than we would the TV. We would come down and listen to records. My mama would play records. It was kind of a way she dealt with her addiction and mental health stuff. And I would like just like come down because we didn't see her out of that room much. So when she'd come out and play records, we'd all gather around the table and listen to whatever she was playing or whatever she had to say. You know what I mean? So music was like always a thing. And when I realized early that my mother loved music, then I immediately was like, oh, this is, you know, I go, what, I had a little poem wrote or something. You know, here's a little song like as early as I can remember. So music's always been... I wrote so many raps and so many, so many songs in jail. Yeah. You know? well also, if it's a time where like you're dealing with a shittier childhood and you notice that music's bringing your family together, you're gonna fucking love that. Mm. Right? Man, it was definitely a part of our therapy. You know what I mean? Especially to see what it did to a woman that I didn't see happy a lot. Like I didn't see my mother very like she was very very tortured soul. She's a different woman now. She's actually really cool. Yeah. Like went gambling with her recently. Like cool as shit. You know. Gambling? But like yeah what yeah. Do you guys play? We went and played blackjack one night after a Willie Nelson show. <laughs> I, I had Damn, me and Willie happy. Nelson did a show together, and that's she epic. called me and she came to the Willie Nelson show. We went and gambled afterwards. How'd what you guys do? Yeah. Oh, dude, won like fifty bands. It was crazy. Oh, that's a huge win. Yeah, I gave my mother a chip, and she thought it was like a hundred dollar chip. It was ten grand. Oh, she so when it? she so when her security the security guy had with her took her there, she was like, "What?" She oh, thought she would stole shit. some. She called me like, "Jason, I think they gave me too much money." I was like, "No, nah, that's what so we you want." Play pretty big action when you gamble. I'll play with y'all if y'all ever want to go. Yeah, we should gamble in Vegas. Yeah, I'd love to. Dude. It'd be a dream too. of mine. Yeah, I'll play. I'll play. I'll have a little fun. Yeah. So you <laughs> you started on YouTube, right? Yes, sir. Uh, YouTube, man. Cool. That's why it's so cool to be here with y'all because I'm like yeah. a YouTube kid. You know what I mean? How was it like for you starting? During YouTube, uh, YouTube era back then, dude, I started during www.youtube.com. Show you my age. It wasn't on. A, you couldn't do it on your phone at all. You yeah. had to do it from a hard laptop. I had you a know big when you thing. Uploaded your first video? Yeah. Oh, shoo, man. I'd say twenty. Um, twenty two thousand. Not yet. Not even twenty two thousand seven. I'm gonna say two thousand seven. Wow. Two thousand. Not. No, I was probably eight or nine. The 10 minute freestyle, I think, went up for the first time when I first got out in 2000, early nine. And 2009, and I can tell you this, it was it's called the 10 minute freestyle. It's like me, we all should watch it one day. It's, if you got 10 minutes to blow, it's funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I just got out of jail and I was rapping. And the reason it was 10 minutes was because YouTube would only allow you to upload a 10 minute video. Mm. And they gave you like a 30 second buffer or something. So I think it was technically like 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Like, whatever the maximum amount of the video they cut off was. So It's a long fucking yeah. time to first help. Bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what's crazy was we rapped for like an hour, and they just chopped it up. We were I just got out of jail, though. I had so many ideas, and I had so many, like, I was so hungry. I'm wearing this goofy-ass polo collared shirt because I just went to see my PO. I'd been out of jail for like 40 hours, you know? Wow. Yeah. What, what clicked in your brain where you were like, okay, let's let's actually record this, and let's put this on the internet? I just was always a dreamer. I just always believed that music was like my only real choice, like my only true chance I had to make it in life was going to be through music. And I, I didn't, I, I put all my cards on that. I was always early to stuff. Like I had a conversation with a friend of mine, it's a musician, and he was talking about when Best Buy was closing its doors because I was in the CD era too, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, you need to hurry up and get you a, a tray card at Best Buy before you can't get them no more. And I thank God for this spirit because right then I thought to myself, I said, and I told him this, I said, man, I'll be honest, I think we should be more focused on trying to get ahead of iTunes yeah, than trying to keep our CDs in stores. Wow. Something and, just hit you? Yeah, something just hit me. I was just like, I just knew the future. Like, you know, I just, not that I knew the future, well, but I was early. smart enough to see it. And for an, un listen, y'all, I'm an uneducated man. So for me to pr like see that even back then was like nobody was seeing it around me. None of the indies in Nashville were, like, seeing it the way I was. I was like, I'm telling you, dude, like, MySpace is the future. Like, you put your songs on MySpace, that's how people are going to hear your music now. You're burning discs for no reason. The whole world's on MySpace. I started feeling like that early. You said the best day was the birthday in jail. Was What was, like, a bad, what was, like, a bad day? <laughs> oh, dude, you know, the whole... I love fucking jail shit. Yeah, no, they're the worst, man. So interesting. I hate that. It gives me so much anxiety. The worst is when you're in the shoe, when you're in the hole. When Anytime you got to do 20, 23 and 1. 
That's the worst. When so you're in a cell by tr- yourself for 23 hours a day and oh, they give you one hour to shower, make one phone call, and stand out in a gated sun kind hours? of. Yeah, it's called 23 and 1. It's maximum security. Some places that? they'll keep you 24 hours. And but in Tennessee, they on, have to let you out. How one long hour. are you in that type of like punishment? or like? I think I did six months in one was the longest I did. But I know dudes that live that way. It's maximum security prisons the same way. Like anytime you go to a real maximum security prison. And you don't, there's no outside, nothing? They have like, it depends on state and federal rules. There's always some sort of a guideline. In Tennessee, they have to give you one hour out of your cell a day and three out, three days of those weeks. This is how it used to be. Keep in mind, I haven't been in trouble in forever. And you had three days they had to offer you the choice to go outside. Okay. Does that make sense? And like, what? But like, it was literally like a cage outside. Like if I put a cage adjacent to this building, just a little cage, like, you know, six by eight feet. But it was just outside of a building. Then you just go stand in your little cage outside the building. And those are the worst days. I don't care. Anything else, you know. Those are the days where you really think about life. Just chill. Just I read a bunch. Yeah, I read a bunch. They were, um, and when you're in the hole, you're allowed to have religious material. So I got a Bible and I got a Quran and I just read. You read a lot of the Bible? I'm completely self-educated. I never finished eighth grade. Did you read like a lot of the Bible? I read the whole Bible, cover to cover. Wow. Did you have any other books or was it? Dude, I've religion? done a thousand podcasts and nobody's ever asked me the shit y'all are asking me, Bubba. And I, <laughs> I mean, I know y'all are good, but just for what it's worth. I mean, I do this. What What did you get out of every like religion? And like, did you stick with like one religion? That you- yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a believer for sure. I'm a Christian. Um, I had a whole thing go viral, so I won't get back in trouble with it. But look it up. I did with Schultz where I talked about how I feel about the church now. Oh. Got me in a little trouble. But it's, uh, you know, I, I still believe in God. I still have a real anchored faith. I believe the church's approach is a little off today as far as like, you know, they're not portraying Jesus the way I know him to be historically. How so? I just think Jesus was a little more gangster. I mean, he does wine and shit. Well, you know, that was his first miracle in the Bible, right? What? Turning water into wine. That was the first. I mean, Jesus, that was, he, I mean and no it's like question. it's little things like that that I get in arguments with, with theologists about is like. That when was you, his, wait, that yeah. was his first miracle. That was the first miracle documented so in the Jesus Bible. Said, I'm sure it wasn't his first I'm gonna miracle. I'm going to impress everyone. I'm going to fucking turn water yeah. into fucking wine. What's actually wine. even cooler, his mother came to him and asked him for the favor. So, to some degree, there's there's argument about the scripture, but it was a wedding reception is the way I interpreted it. This is where every pastor on earth takes this clip and dissects what every word I say. I'm just sitting here fucking high talking about God. But it's like, and from my from my reading and understanding of the theology is that it was a wedding reception. His mother comes to him and goes, I need a favor. Can Jesus, you turn this? No yeah, yeah, can you turn this water into wine? And he goes, Woman, it's not my time. To, I think that was the exact quote in one of the scriptures. Woman, it's not my time. And to some degree, my ad lib is she was like, please. And he was like, Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's like Yo, so listen, I didn't know that. there's layers to this story, right? Let's peel it apart and how this shows you how cool Jesus is on the front end. One, he'd been doing cool shit and nobody knew it. Because why would she come randomly ask him to turn water into wine? She doesn't see him revive a squirrel. Something's happened. She's seen him. There's do some something dope. there She's that she knows there's some something shit. different with this dude. Yeah. She knows this. Mary is aware of this enough to come to him, which is very telling. And then she goes, you know, hey hook me up and that he immediately is kind of stern with her like no i'm not flexing like you're right tripping like this like, it's mom, not time for that right now yeah and then the human side of jesus comes out because it's his mother come on man it's like mama leaning on you a little bit come on boy all right you know what i mean yeah that's to me that was the first miracle i think it was in a i'm pretty sure it's in mark i hadn't read the bible in a long time to be honest but you know? When you break it down like that, I mean, that's I look a at fucking it completely beauty different. Move. Well, I break it down like that, and people understand it. And then some fucking mega church pastor will crucify me on TikTok next week about. And I'm so like, lost. and my whole argument is like, yo, I'm telling a story that these dudes didn't even really know, but kind of knew. Yeah. And I'm giving people that otherwise have never thought of that story a different perspective of it. Like, I thought the church would be like oh, super proud of what I'm doing. Like, talking yeah, like, shame oh, okay. me. Like, oh, you're cussing in the middle of it. Your words mean nothing with your curses. I was like, God will use the most unlikely messenger. I didn't realize how much of a beauty move that was. Like the wine, the wedding must have just been like completely dry, out of wine. It was a the party was flopping. Let's have fun with this for a minute. The party. Do you know how down the party's got to be for the mother to come to you and be like, "Look, I mean, if you run out of alcohol at a wedding, I know you told me not to tell nobody. Yeah, but you got this thing's going south. Yeah, they're finna argue. 
I'm watching the groom and wife in the argue. This is our last chance. You know what I'm saying? That's how I perceive it to when I'm the reading. Party, right? Yeah, it's like you saved the party, dude. It's like I was the first thing he ever did. So you just can't convince me that you dude. He flipped over tables and temples and told him quit making a merchant of my father's house. Jesus did a lot of gangster stuff. Churches. That's like, all I say. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Church is like <laughs> I. I had to go to church. Like my mom made me go when I was younger every single Sunday. Mm-hmm. I used to hate it because it was just like. It was so boring, you know what right. I mean? But I still believe in God. But yeah, I think like that you're right. The church and just like the way you have to worship God and the way they tell you to worship God is just like it feels, yeah, outdated. I'm and too boring. much of a free thinker, especially in this era, for us to think there's only one way to do it. That's what I was gonna say. Though. You know what I mean? I mean That's kind of my God. thing. At any time. At you any time. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, it's like even though they're like use too many cuss words, I was like, we don't even know what cuss words were back then. Right, but you also, the, you did it different because you have your own interpretation because you're not going to church. You just have the Bible and you're in jail in a cell, so you're yeah. making your own version kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, I was just reading the word. I was like, oh, this is a cool story. Yeah. There's a lot of crazy stories in the Bible, man. I learned a lot from the what's, Bible. What's another cool one? Because I didn't fucking know that. Um, And I took religion t- till grade 12. Yeah. No, dude, that was, dude. Uh, what we talked about, uh, I always talk about when Jesus was protecting the town whore. And he was he, he was doodling in the sand, and all the Pharisees came to him and said, "You got to do something to this woman." And that's when the famous phrase "Remove the log from your own eye before you worry about the speck in mine" came from. You ever heard that? So there's a famous phrase in the Bible that says, uh, "Remove the remove the log." There's so many interpretations of the Bible, obviously. That says, "Remove the log from your eye before I, before you worry about the speck in mine." Okay. So it's saying you're over here worried about what's happening with me, and you got a lot of stuff going on with you. Mm-hmm. And that's when, and then the. Um, but when they came to him about the town whore, he's doodling in the sand. And that's what the, the, the scripture pretty much says. He was just like drawing, like just like if you had a stick fucking off in the sand. And these Pharisees are standing over him like, what are you going to do about this woman? And he was like, you telling me none of y'all never sinned? And they were like, well, that's different. He's like, ain't nothing different. Why was it Jesus' job to do something about the town whore? Well, they were coming to him about like trying to find the flaws in his scripture and his philosophy. Mm. Keep in mind, he's running around telling everybody, I'm the son of man. I'm here to change the world. You know what I mean? Like I am here, you know, like I have become God in flesh form. Like it was a wild concept. Like that time, just that whole era. If you think about like the insanity of this guy coming around and being like, I'm telling you, I'm the son of God. And then, you know, like, like my, my mother was a virgin. She never slept with my father. You know, like if that's your story and you're anchoring it around and you're running, you're testing all these principles. So all these guys who knew all the scriptures would try to come to him and go, what about this? What about this? Well, what would you do in this situation? You know, they were just kind of leaning on him. Damn. It's an interesting thing, man. It's a, well, it's a did, really cool. Did you, did you have any other things that like fascinated you or you read while you were in there? Yeah. I mean, dude, I learned a lot from like studying a little bit of Buddhism. Uh, I read the Quran. Totally get it. I how'd understand like those principles. Quran? I respect Muslims so much, huh? How did you like the Quran? I loved like it. Reading it. Yeah, I loved it. Um, it's actually more of a fluid read than the Bible, as far as like being able to read the Bible so all over the place and just so the Quran is kind of really sticks to a storyline all the way through where the Bible kind of runs all off everything. But I knew a lot of Muslim dudes in jail, so I understood the concept of their religion, and I just loved it. By and large, and this is this is why I do talk about God openly, I believe I've learned more from, like, especially in jail, if there was some sort of a religious factor or a gang factor, weirdly enough, you could always, there was more peace in the unit. You know what I mean? Like Muslims move, especially in prison, very together. You know what I mean? And they they they're very they don't take no they, they're no nonsense, but they're very respectful, and their religion's not hateful at all. We got a completely disoriented view of, like we do Christianity, where the weird mega church pastor that talks down on me is you know the guy that we judge is like the basic Christian. Where I think most Christians are more like me, anyways. Same thing with Muslims. Like every Muslim I ever met was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let never me, never felt threatened by one. I have a question. Did you ever get, like, messed with in jail? Like, I know there's probably a lot of guys in there that are like... Man, I'm fat. I've been getting messed with my whole life, Salim. And every corner, <laughs> every wonder, crevice, I mean, man, I had to scary. fight every week. Dude, I kind of feel yeah. like you, you could get along with any crew, though, yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I also... It's jail. Yes, you're going to fight. That's just a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Dude, I boxed when I was in the juvenile justice system. They had a boxing coach in there. I mean, I, we fought 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 like we fought our whole lives i just i just quit fighting as i've gotten older wow. even 
10, when I first met my wife, I was still like, would get in a bar fight all the time. Like it took years to conquer that anger. I was an angry little yeah. insecure and then I was overweight. So it just made it even easier for people to fuck with me. So it just made me more aggressive, you know? And it's like, I just, I just like the work I'm the most proud of on myself and my life change is probably like my ability to be unbothered now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you'd have to spit on my kid or something for me to like want to get physical with you. At this point, Brantley Gilbert's a good friend of mine. He's a country music artist. And he says it best. He said, at this point, if you get me mad enough to fight you, I just assume shoot you. If you get me that fucking mad, you know what right. I'm saying? Yeah, like absolutely. if I'm mad enough to get physical, you probably did something to make me mad enough to shoot you. you yeah. know what so what, you had a big bar fight career too? <laughs> well, we fought. We We were just young and on tour. So we would like... I don't know. It's like, uh, you know, like we were playing all those bar shows. I used to do 200 shows a year, like a rock and roll band. We'd open yeah. up for everybody. So you get in bar fights, you know, every tour at least. 100%. Where, Just where, happens. Where was, where did the most bar fights go down? Like Nashville? Um, no, 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 no. We, we, I mean, we'd fight at home, but not much. You don't shit where you sleep. But it was always random when you're just out of town and it's just, you know how that shit is. Especially yeah. when you're torn, just like seven or eight of us living in a, not, six, I mean, six of us living in a 95 conversion van. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're uh -huh. doing $50 shows and some guy in Wyoming doesn't pay you. So you try to steal his TV off the wall of his 200 person bar and his boys pull up and y'all got our tussle. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, just yeah. that kind of old tour, poor, just trying to figure it out, sleeping in the van shit. What do you think was your favorite? <laughs> like, what was the best about those days? Because that when you're like doing those $50 shows. Oh, dude, the freedom. Yeah. Yeah, because y'all know this, because y'all seen it too, is that we, we're blessed that, you know, I never wanted money. I just wanted freedom. And then you get to a point where you become so successful, you actually give up a little bit of your freedom in exchange for your success mm. because your schedule is, you know, your schedule is now, you're, you're, now, you're now a slave to your calendar. Mm -hmm. But back then it was true freedom. You did you know say what I mean? chase the cool and not the, not the money, right? I've seen the yeah. quote that you said. Where, when did you start like saying that quote? Oh, dude, chase the cool, not the money. Always. Man, I've always believed that you just look for like, even back then, we were just looking for the coolest tour. It didn't matter if it was 300 people. It's like, dude, you got a chance to go out with the insane clown posse or twisted. I'm you like, we're in. More, right? Yeah, you're like, I'm in. That sounds cool. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, dude, example, Kyle texted me. I don't want to date this podcast. So I'm going to say two days ago, a day ago, 20 some hours ago. Yeah. And said, hey, I'm in Miami from now until these dates and this date. Or, or he said, these are the dates I'm here. Just come whenever. Forty some hours later, I'm sitting here talking to y'all. Yeah, you know what I mean? Less. Like, because yeah, like you know 36. what? This is fucking cool. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't about no money. It costs me money to come down here, right? But it's like I wasn't even gonna wait for y'all to come to me. I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna catch Kyle while he wants to talk to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a fucking. I think this podcast is cool as fuck. I've Appreciate watched, you, I'd right? say, eighty percent of y'all's episodes. You know fuck what I mean? It. Like for real. Like I actually watch the pod. So it's like, I'm like, I always chase the cool, not the money. Because I've learned that money will follow whatever, whatever the cool thing is that's happening. You know what I mean? Money And money also is like, it's easy to say when you got it. But I would have, I'd have done this shit for free. And I proved that because I've got 15 years that I did it for free. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm saying something like, it's easy to say now that you got money. It's like, what are you talking about? I yeah. could show you the 15 years where I did it for free. Yeah. You're completely free. It's like those $50 shows, we were breaking even. Dude, I didn't even have a home, house at home. When, when I go back to Nashville, I still slept in the when van. When you're in those like smaller moments too, I know I can relate too. It's like you look back and you didn't even really know what you were like on at mm. the time too. Like it's just such a blur. For sure. But yeah, I think that's one thing people are always trying to like get to where they're at and they're not enjoying that grind, that struggle to get it. there, right? Yeah. You always got to enjoy even it. Even now we probably have like bigger goals that we want to achieve, but right. like we're not appreciating where we are, where we are right now right. too, you know? I, I, I took a practice going into 23 that I'm going to carry through 24 was presence because I found myself having these mega moments and not in them because I was thinking about the next mega moment and I was like, or my phone, and I was like, I'm detaching. Like, when I walk into stuff now, I'm there. 100%. Whatever I'm doing, that's all that matters. I'm 100% in that particular You're moment. thinking like next, next, next. Yeah, it's next. like I don't even like, all that matters in life to me right now is that I'm fucking sitting here with Nelk on the fucking Full Sin podcast talking to y'all you're always gonna have bigger and bigger goals too like you look back at old times you're like that was so awesome that was so awesome but like you gotta appreciate that's what i'm trying to do a lot more too is like appreciate the moment for sure you know? especially the, the firsts got. especially the first because i was just sitting here thinking like just from us talking like and me willing this into my world is like i think we're all gonna be friends forever now 100 percent. like i think we'll be boys forever and i think i'll come back and do this podcast again 
in 10 months when my album drops or whatever. 100%. Whenever I call y'all for a favor and go, yo, the album's coming Definitely. out, they'll throw me a bone. But we'll never do it the first time again. No. This is it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I'm conscious of that. Like, that's why I'm so giddy about being here. Is, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to embrace that excitement. Like, I did a New Year's Eve, Dick Clark. It was crazy. That's I do, epic. I've been watching the ball drop my whole life, right? So I go, and I got this thing I do when I'm overly excited where I hug people too hard or I pick them up. And I don't mean to. It's just I'm like a big yogi bear. You know what I'm saying? I'm just a big touchy kind of guy anyways, you know? And I picked up Ryan Seacrest. And I'll show you the video. And I pick up Ryan Seacrest, and I'm kind of shaking him around because I'm just so excited. And my wife was like, you did that thing. And I was like, no, I didn't. She was like, you picked up Ryan Seacrest. I was like, oh. Because sometimes I'll get so excited, I'll be like loud, like the CMA speech. That's me when I'm excited. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like that in our living room. My wife is like, yeah, you were just doing what you do at the kitchen table when you start really getting, somebody <laughs> starts fucking with your gas and you up, you know? Because I'm excited. Yeah, and like I don't think I'm too cool to be excited. Auth- you people can feel your authenticity, right? Like, you're, you can just tell you're an authentic guy. You are who you are. That's why people love you, right? Yeah, for sure. So I feel like you could get away. You, that makes you be able to get away with shit too. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, yo, we can't get mad at Doctor Jelly. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> I love this Doctor Jelly thing, by yeah. the way. No, he's definitely a doctor. <laughs> who, who would you say is, uh, was your biggest imp- inspirations like growing up uh, for music and stuff? Oh, dude, this will be fun to talk about. So Three Six Mafia is on the short list. You know what I mean? I had them on tour this year, which was insane. But um, a lot of local rap, too. Quanti Cash, Haystack, Pistol, Top Dollar, a lot of local stuff. But uh, UGK, 8-Ball and MJG on the hip-hop side. <sighs> anything anything Ghetto Boys, you know, that whole era. I don't know if y'all were from. Am I speaking what's, Greek what's right? Some, Have y'all ever listened yeah, to Southern know, Rap? This is fun. I didn't know Wait, no, one, bro, real quick. My mind playing tricks on me is one of the best yes. songs of all time. Come on, yes, man. let's fucking I'm go. like that, yeah. Yes, dope. What are, you, are you familiar with any of these Southern rappers? <laughs> no, <laughs> Yo, so are y'all I familiar with... I think I've heard I know Ghetto Boys, UGK, fucking obviously 3-6 Mafia. Yeah. I know you did Hard Out Here for a Pimp, which yep. is gangster. I did that at Bonnaroo. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool, man. They, um... Yeah, I grew up on, like, super Southern rap and, of course, like, 70s music. Uh, Jim Croce, James Taylor. My sister introduced me to, like, Nirvana, uh, Pearl Jam, the whole 90s grunge era. She brought me up into that. My brother turned me on to all the hip-hop. My mother listened to country. Real outlaw country, though, like Waylon and Willie. You know what I mean? Like Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard. 90, 90s music. Yeah, 90s too. A lot of country. Like a lot of 90s. Like for sure. Those guys. Okay. Yeah. How Tupac. Important, how important is it to be like, because I see all the time people like, yo, that's 90s hot. country too. My fault. Just like Tracy <laughs> Lawrence, George Strait, Garth Brooks. Yeah. My mother, man, Garth Brooks, dude. I could probably sing more Garth Brooks songs than Garth Brooks can. Performing in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, I went to see a show. In Vegas? Yeah, I'm that big. I'm telling you, dude, I'm not too cool to be a fan, dude. I'll pop up to a show, dog. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, uh, how important is it to be like, like people always compare, like, yo, that's not real country. This is real country. Like, <coughs> who who defines which what's real and what's not? You know, man, I'm just, I don't know. It's um, I got in trouble recently because I had a quote where I was jokingly said, "How much more country could I be? Should I fuck a goat?" <laughs> and it's like, and I got in so much trouble, I'm gonna double down on this podcast about it. But it's like, I don't. I think the country, there's two different things. One, there's being country and being country music, right? Is like, because even country music as far as time has been wasn't always just super country rednecks. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like country music's always had a wide stroke. Like Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson wasn't singing about fishing or hunting. You know what I mean? And they were as authentically country as you could be. To me, country music is three chords and the truth. And I know in my soul that what I do is right three chords and the truth. I know if I don't write nothing else, I write the truth. You know what I mean? Um, and I know I'm from Nashville, and I know that y'all don't know me from the man on the moon, but I'm sure just based on my dialect alone, you probably think I, you would th- assume I'm country. Mm-hmm. So it's like I tell people country is relative. You know what I mean? If you grew up in southern Alabama, and I grew up in the metropolis of Nashville, Tennessee, and you grew up outside of Montgomery, you might look at me as city country. You know what I mean? Yeah. But Meanwhile, if I go to New York City, like I just did, I mean, I was the fucking, I was like a hillbilly compared to every other (laughs) artist on Dick Clark's show. You know what I mean? Like, I was clearly country music. I was so country that I got lit up on Twitter for the first time. A whole new audience found me. It was like, who the fuck is this redneck rapping at (laughs) fucking New Year's Eve? I trended for like five minutes. It was so bad. (laughs) It was just, you know, but it's like, that's how somebody sitting at their house in, you know, New Jersey felt. 
right? They, or wherever they, whatever metropolis they were coming from, or some even somebody from the outskirts of town, just like, yo, who is this hillbilly rapping on Dick Clark's New Year's Eve? Because I'm up there with Sabrina Carpenter and you know, fucking T Pain or something. You know what I mean? So, but to me, being it's funny country, to picture you like walking down the street in New York City a little bit. Yeah, right. Yeah, hmm. yeah, and it's like you'll see how country I am in that setting. I did the Jingle Balls this year. Oh, nice. It's like me, One Republic, Sabrina Carpenter, Olivia Rodrigo. It's one of those one shows. Republic. Everybody does 20 minutes. And it's like, you know, I'm out there singing rap covers, but, I'm, you know, it sounds like Billy Ray Cyrus is singing them to those, those, some of those kids, you know? All I seen was tweets like, I hate country music, but I love Jelly Roll. And I was like, that's, you know, but you'd never know that. So the country thing is I long answer, Bubba, because I've been wanting to talk about this. Yeah, yeah. Is to me it's just what my spirit is country music. The fact that I had a big song on pop radio and some rock radio hits is is cool, but my spirit, my heart is, you know, you come to Nashville, I told Kyle, we'll do country shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we'll definitely dip off. Like fishing for catfish, that's pretty country, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Noodling or hand billy hand uh, uh, hillbilly hand fishing. What's that? So there's a woman you should look her up. Are we you into that kind of stuff? An elk video and just yeah, fuck around. Some real yeah, we'll shit. take you. We'll take you to Hannah Barron then. Hannah Barron is like she's famous on on Instagram. Check her out. She 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 she, she noodles. That's what she does on season. You talking about that? She's crazy, man. So what She'll is get it? Big. It's called, where you where you put your uh, you put your arm down in the hole, right? And it's in where the, the catfish are, and the catfish will bite your arm because the they're fuck? big. Yeah, they're they're yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah, 50, 60 that. pounds. They're huge. And you'll grab it and bring out. They're hundred pounds. I mean, they're huge, huge. And you'll bring out the whole catfish on your arm. Like your arm is the hook. The bait. Your arm Does is it the hurt bait. When they bite you, yeah, you feel it for sure. It's a fucking very aggressive, very heavy yeah, fucking pounds. fish biting. You know, it's, you feel it, but it's not bad, bad. You can't lose your arm. No, no, you're not gonna lose your arm. Okay. No, 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 for sure. No. And Hannah, Hannah, will show us out there, dude. She's I'm the down. most famous one Maybe on we earth start for with it. Some fishing rods, though, before we get yeah, yeah, we'll just go fishing. We could, now, we could just come to Tennessee. We'll go ride four wheelers and fish. That's whatever. Yeah, that's more our speed. I yeah, think. yeah. My uncle's had a farm since I was a kid. It's where I shot my first gun. Let's go out there and dick off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Fun. That was my sales pitch to Cal initially. Yeah, he said come out to Tennessee, dude. Yo, I was that. like, yo, I was like, we'll do some shit, dog. I was on the farm that day. I walk on the farm every day as part of my Gary Brecker plan. I'm on my health shit right now. Yeah, and every day I walk the farm, and uh, every so I hit, that's when I hit him because that's when I do my my thinking. You know what I mean? And he hit me in that moment. I was like, yo, I'm out here now, dog. I was like, we'll catch some shit on fire. Let's, Let's do it. We'll yeah, yeah. Let's do that for a Nelk video. We'll come out yeah. and we'll film it for the Nelk channel. Oh, it'll be a fucking ball. We'll, 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 we'll go crazy. For the Nelk channel, we'll do it double down. Oh, yeah. We'll go real stupid. Hell you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> that shit'll be dope. Um, when did you decide to get on the health shit? Did we talk about that? No. Oh, no. We talked about it. We were going to talk about it off camera. And I was like, we should talk about this on. Um, I met with, I messaged Gary shortly after my CMA speech went viral. And I just cold hit him. And um, just like I did you, you know, I'm like I said, I'm a fan. I hit him. I was like, yo, look, and I, I was joking, but I was real. I was like, do y'all work with fat people too? I hadn't seen nobody lose like real weight. You know, mm -hmm. he's like, dude, whatever. We're huge fans. He's like his, uh, him and his wife, Sage, uh, Sage hit me up first and was like, yo, hit me. Let's, let's do it. And he just instantly was in and how God works is like, they were like, well, we need to get blood. And I was like, ah, I don't know when I'll be in Miami next. And then I looked at my calendar. I was like, you won't believe this. I'll be in Fort Lauderdale Sunday. I was headlining Riptide Fest. And they were like, oh, we'll come up there and do your blood. And she came up. They did my blood that day. And uh, I met with Gary. Right, I was going to come to the UFC, and I was going to meet y'all there, too, but I didn't get to make it. Um, the Covington fight. Oh, shit. That was in Miami, right? Mm -hmm. No, Vegas. it was in Vegas. Vegas. Oh, okay. It was in Vegas. It was just the last one a oh, month ago. Oh, that was just now. I was, coming, coming, I was coming from L.A., and Gary flew with me from L.A. to Vegas because I was doing NFR with Lanny Wilson that weekend. In Vegas, because NFR was the same weekend as the Kobe Covington thing, the rodeo. Yeah, yeah. Rodeo. And uh, me and Laney Wilson were going to link up, and I was sick, and I knew, I felt like it was COVID. So I just went home, and it was. I ended up getting real sick. But, um, yeah, right then, Gary went over my labs, and I woke up the next day and cut sugars, cut processed foods completely out of my life, been supplementing, you know, been, been on my Gary Brecker shit, dog. What about exercise? Working, walking every day. That's all I'm doing right now is walking. That's all I have time to do, but it's my anchor. I wake up in the morning seven days a week, and I go walk. What's been like the hardest thing for you or the biggest change? Food. I've had a horrible relationship with food my whole life. Dieting it's the one the drug I've never got rid of. Tough, bro, even for like yeah, it's the us. one it's the one addiction that still really haunts me deeply. It's hard, bro. And Dieting it's rooted in yeah, I had to get ready to do this with Gary too. One mentally, but two, I had to do a lot of work last year in therapy to really figure out what I was hungry for. You know what I mean? Like what I was looking for and kind of dealing with my life and being very open to 
dealing, you know, going back into that and figuring out the trauma that did it to get me prepared. But the like sugar craving and the idea of like, I'm sure you know this. Y'all travel a ton too. You know, I'm still traveling 300 days a year. Mm-hmm. Right. It's hard when you travel. Too. Yeah, it's hard. And it's like, I'm eating nothing but plants and proteins as Gary suggests. And it's like, man, that's hard to find, so believe you cut, it or not. Yeah, did you cut greens? Yeah, like I cut no all rice, that shit. No bread? No, I'll do I'll do rice if it's organic, but no bread at all. No bread. For sure. And no bread, nothing so processed, no tortillas, no you wraps. Some, you just did good hot sauce, bro. You put yeah. some chicken. No, but yeah. yeah. No, the food's not bothering, but like the accessibility right. of yeah. plants and proteins, believe like it or not, that are airport, not wedged yeah. between bread, that are not stuck between a wrap or a fucking quesadilla. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like it's <laughs> stuff's different, dude. That's you know? the biggest struggle. Cause I cut grains for a bit. Uh, for 60 days too and yeah when you're in the airport or if you're hungry or like there's nothing to really eat yeah, you know what yeah. i mean but i've done i've done good everywhere, everywhere. i just got a plan like super ahead yeah so i just actually like know where i'm going like i had food waiting at the studio for me before i came here i got food waiting in the car on the way to the air like i'm just very diligent about it now i'm taking it serious but a lot of it too has just been a lot of supplement my hormones were just off you know what i mean and you know what gary does he gets in there and starts really you know he gets in there and it's on his biologist shit. Yeah. So he really made me understand, and I feel good. I feel better than I've ever felt. What's your goal? I'm what's like three, four weeks in and no sugar, and I feel incredible. What's your goal with it? Is it to like lose a certain amount of weight or just feel better? I'm losing weight, but it's just feeling better, man. Yeah. Just when you know, I just want to feel normal. I just, I had a realization this year, Kyle, that I have somehow been blessed to be in this position to help people uh-huh. and change my life and my family's life, and I have done it in spite of carrying multiple humans on my shoulders you know what i mean like i'm just tired of being tired you know it has nothing to do with vanity it has nothing to do with how i look it has nothing to do with uh any it just really is genuinely like i just want to feel good yeah like and you, when I, you don't have energy yeah i just like i'm listening to the gary brecker stuff and i listen to y'all's pot since y'all been on you all shit you know what i mean and i'm hearing cal talk about how different he feels and and i'm hearing people talk about feeling good and i'm like fuck i've never felt good you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I only, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I couldn't even imagine. Gary looked at my blood work and was like, dog, I can't imagine what you're going to be like when you can actually think. He's like, because your blood work tells me you can't think. It tells me that you are in a fog. You know what I mean? He's like, man, you are, you're going to be a different dude in 12 weeks. And I'm four or five weeks in and I already feel fucking great. Are, are you great. getting like a cold tub or the sauna or anything like that? I've been doing cold showers. I'm getting a cold tub, but I've been doing a cold how, shower. How I got to ease myself those in, man. Hard. Those things are brutal, dude. Yeah, they are. They, and it seems easy. <laughs> like, I'm just going to sit in cold water for three minutes. And you're like, fuck. You fuck feel like that. you can't breathe. Yeah. Like, am I the only one that yeah, thinks I'm dying? I'm it's hard. For me, <laughs> for me, it feels like I can't breathe. Well, I'm I'm just like, starting, one it's good hard breath. after a fucking night of drinking. Oh. It's 10 times harder, but it's the it's such a good hangover cure. Does it really help oh, with yeah. if you do like cold tub <laughs> hot tub cold tub hot tub cold tub oh. it's like the best thing you could do for a hangover Get that's like what i need oh. after a hangover now because yeah. i can't deal with the hangovers the way i used to when i was like 21 or some right. shit i'm 29 now <laughs> yeah Ooh. It so now worse. it's like bro one night of fucking big sand is like i was watching the gronk pod and he was talking about that when and I, when he was saying it i was like man i dude i mean I've always got violent hangovers, but now they're like two dayers. It's fucked. Yeah. It's I like, just can't do yeah. it anymore. Bro. I can like, drink like once every two weeks now almost. And I got to like make sure the next day is wide open. Uh, and I got an eye yeah. ready. Not and, doing shit. Yeah, no, I got to prepare my hangovers now. You know what I mean? For Where sure. I used to love just I, my favorite drunks were the random ones. I don't get those as much no more. You know what I mean? Dude, That's I, still my favorite mushroom trip or acid trip. Is what? The random one. Oh, yeah. Like when just the home, like how Salim didn't plan on fucking Hitting getting super high before the pod. Then I show up with a rig and he's like, fuck it, we're getting high. Those are the best highs. Like that's the best mushroom trip. When you're sitting with a home and he's like, what are you doing today? You're like, man, I kind of ain't doing nothing today. But I'm finally off. And he's like, we should take mushrooms. I have some. And you're like, I'm in. Yeah. That's awesome. That's the best mushroom trip. What what like era did you go through like a super like party phase? Like a what ages? <sighs> man. 24 <laughs> until a to, year ago yeah from 13 <laughs> to 38 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, i just slowed down last year i uh i got off cocaine is what changed it for me yeah. i realized that i love drinking but i love doing cocaine more than drinking and i would drink just to do cocaine there's times when it's like peanut butter and jelly right for sure but sometimes no just, two sometimes drugs go together have, better. sometimes you just gotta have a peanut butter sandwich for you don't sure. need the jelly yeah but no two drugs go together better you know what i'm saying and what really got me was I just, I guess, I, for honestly, the fentanyl epidemic 
did you like did you have like a moment where you're like i gotta stop or like well or is it just kind of like i had i had came off of codeine and pills and that was hard when i first got with my wife i was like really really strung out and when i sobered really got off that and dealt with it and, and got into the program and really started understanding sobriety I started getting back into alcohol and then eventually cocaine as it always leads. And then I got off Coke and I'll still have a drink and I'm more, I manage it better today than I've ever managed it. But I do so much for sober living and for the sobriety and for the recovery community that there's a misconception that I am sober and I, I'm, I'm not, but I, I, I am totally anti drugs. Yeah. In this era of my life, I'm against all drugs except well, for, I don't consider mushroom a drug. What, what if you don't mind me asking, like, what was your day like when you were, like, doing, like, all those types of drugs? Like, would you wake up and just, like, do a pill, like, right in the morning? Yeah, or? I mean, I'd wake up and take, like, a pain pill or something like that, like a Percocet or something. I'd, you know, hide behind. i have a hangover, so it'd be a reason to take right. a Percocet. And by two or three that afternoon, but whatever time, I, you know, within the next two hours, I'd be sipping syrup. I'd be for sure pouring codeine in a Sprite, like, 100% of the time. And then later that day, my heart beat so slow. But I'd do some coke or something to try to balance. You know, I was just constantly trying to balance the equation. I was living in a constant state. And by the end of the night, you're taking a Xanax. Yeah. Because you can't come down because you've yeah. done too much blow now. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, my heart's going too fast now and I can't drink codeine. Or When I look back at the drugs I was doing together, they were supposed to interact in a way that it should have killed me forever ago. You know, whenever I, my wife was the and my wife partied. She did blow and drank heavy. But, I mean, we I mean, first got together and she was like, you got to get the fuck off that codeine. The, the, like especially now too I don't know if it's just because we're older but yeah drugs are just fucking they're everywhere bro yeah. like you can't like it's it's fucking everywhere you gotta really have self control and like you gotta kinda you gotta gotta know what you want when you like go out now no for like, sure like there's not a time I go I don't go out that I don't see fucking cocaine now like it's fucking somebody's it's not, fucking everywhere no it's everywhere so. at the time it's the most dangerous but I think it's because we're older too but I was always the guy with it you know I was the guy that blocked off bathrooms you know what I mean like we just took over bathrooms at establishments like fucking a bunch of you know what I mean like the we urinal's were, wide open and you're yeah. just waiting for the handicap yeah, stall yeah, yeah literally people are just like fuck here goes these guys you know yeah. we're just coming to just rail out bathrooms but did you get caught a lot like doing blow like yeah, well, we did it publicly. I always believed that cocaine was for the lip. Then. Yes, whenever, wherever. And Listen, just people wouldn't care. You've been around me enough now to see my personality. Imagine yeah. this personality okay, yeah, on I cocaine. Agree with that. You know what I'm I saying? I can agree just, with that. Okay. Just imagine me on a fifth of Crown Royal and an eight ball. You know what I'm saying? What do you look like at that point? Because you don't seem like an aggressive dude anymore. No, I was so, even then. I, oh, dude, I, I'm still to this day. I'm, I, you, you, I know y'all drank with everybody. My word is, we will make a memory. Yeah. I promise you, I go dark. It is my shit. And I'm happy. I'm a big, happy, lovable drunk. I'm just, it just intensifies who I am. Back then, I wasn't a good, I'm a real, like, man, thank you for this, actually. I've changed who I am as a human. I always believe that, uh, two things I believe, money doesn't create character, it reveals it. Same thing I believe about alcohol. Alcohol doesn't create character, it reveals character. You know what I mean? Yeah. When I was a bad human, I drank a lot and became a worse human. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, as my, my as my heart softened up, when I drink now, I just want to love people. I just want to hug on you and ask you how you're doing. I, I become a big brother. You know what I'm saying? You've been drinking, you've been drinking water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I turn into that, you ate vegetables today guy. You know? <laughs> I'm that guy. Add us on Nelk Boys, because we are posting on Snapchat every single day. All the crazy shit that's happening, we're posting it in real time. It's literally like a daily vlog. We have over 2 million followers on there. It's getting over like a million views a day. It's crazy. Search up Nelk Boys, add us, because if you guys want to see all the crazy shit that's happening in the fucking Nelk world in real time, Snapchat is the best way to do it. Just want to tell you guys that quick. Let's get back into the podcast. You talked about the money. What is What did change for you, though? Because you talk about it reveals your character. Like, did you ever feel like at one point you were becoming something you didn't want to be? Because it took you, like you said, you grinded for 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. But lucky for me, none of it before success. I, I, I tell people, I don't think God blessed me a day before he knew I was ready for it. I think that if he'd have gave me this money when I was, uh, that's why I'm proud of watching y'all grow. If he'd have gave me y'all's money at y'all's age, I'd have died. Mm. I'd have got myself killed. Somebody would have shot me or I'd have overdosed. I just had no no perimeter i had no understanding of more i had no moral compass mm -hmm. you know what i mean i had no vision it's like god i think a lot of this was god just kind of letting me tinker around and, and figure out you know 
I think that's why my philanthropy is so big too, is that I just, you know, I'd have took all that money and burned it and spent it on fucking cocaine and strippers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, now it's like, I just take all this money and give it away as much as I can. You know what I mean? It's just different. Well, dude, when you're doing it for so long and you're happy doing it without the money, and then it finally comes, it's just like icing on the cake kind of, right? Brother, I was getting 50 bucks or $500 or now 500 grand or whatever for a show. Yeah. It was like, it was just the idea that when I was there, it was a 100% chance I wasn't going to jail for selling drugs. Yeah. It was a 100% mm -hmm. chance I wasn't going to get killed. It was a 100% chance that I wasn't going to get arrested or brought up on a federal charge or, you know what I mean? Like, that's what this dream always signified to me. It was never really about the money. It was just about, like, the fact that I'm here, I'm connecting with people, I'm serving a purpose, I'm helping people, and I'm not risking my freedom today. How does it hit you when you walk out to a stadium with fucking 25, 30,000 people now? I cry every night on stage, every night. Like, I cry all the time. I mean, I cry like a bitch, like a lot. But I try to explain it to people it's where I'm from. Like, when you really actually come from that far down and fight those kind of addictions in life and carry this kind of fucking weight on me and carry, you know, you carry, you go through all that stuff and in and out of jail and nobody, dude, listen, if there was a, what do they call them things, least likely or most likely in school? What do they call them? They have yeah, a word for Yeah, most likely too. Like most yeah. likely to yeah. run for president. Yeah, or some shit. but like I would have least likely to succeed by every merit of everybody who ever knew me ever. And every you by yourself at that point, right? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, like, so when you do that and you go on to do this, and then the music I make is helping people, Kyle. Mm. It's helping people. It's like, it's touching people, Steiny. It's like, it's not just something they're banging on the way to the club. This is like introspective. Like, they're playing me at funerals. They're playing me at recovery houses across America. Like, I'm helping people through this music. And I'm getting insane amounts of money for something I would do for free. You yeah, know what I mean? Easy. Like it's it seems like, like a blessing from I'm, God, bro. Yeah, it's a God blessing, right? dog. It's like, and so I get emotional. I cry. You walk out and look at 15,000 people and you're like, dude, there was a time I don't think, you know, there, there was a time I couldn't get a visitor. And 15,000 people bought a ticket to see me in Wyoming. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's my thought process. It's like, you know what I'm saying? Like I sold 30,000 tickets in Washington. You know, at one show and you're looking like, dude, I couldn't, there was a time in my life where I meant so little and I was such a bad human that I could not even get nobody to visit me. Like my dad would come see me once a month. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have a friend that would come see me. I didn't have a family member. You know what I mean? Like I was that bad of a human. You know what I'm saying? That dude, outside those, of my family, like cousins and stuff. All those emotions like that, that's what comes out when you see 30,000 people, like all those memories and stuff. Yeah, well, like them too, then. because there's some lady in the front yeah, row that's holding yeah. a sign that goes, man, your music changed my life, and she's crying just because I walked out on stage. Yeah. And uh, there's signs everywhere, like a wrestling, you know, like a, like a WWE, but there are signs that say stuff like, we played Son of a Sinner at my son's funeral with a picture of her son on this big, big poster, and I see it in Section 201. You know what I mean? Like, man, between that and where I came from, dude, the fact that we did this, I... I almost, I teared up over here telling y'all about tearing up. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's just, even sitting here with y'all, dog, like, I don't know how I ended up on y'all's radar. Love to hear that, by the way. But it's like, I would have just, even when y'all started this pod a couple years ago, right? It's been a couple years yeah, now, right? Yeah, it's been like two years and a bit. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, even when y'all started this pod, it's like, I wouldn't have thought. Even then, like, the concept that I would get invited on the pod was absurd. In my mind, like as a guy watching, I'm like, that's a pop culture podcast. Like, no way, I, no way, you know, no way I do something to make it over there. You know what I mean? It's like you just keep having these kind of like landmark moments that are like, man, this is just fucking all unreal to me. Did, did you have anybody? I mean, you talk about no one would visit you while you're locked up, not even your family, right? Did anybody actually believe in you the entire process? Man, my father and my mother. My father really did, man. Uh, the story I tell is I would go sit down with him at this bar called the Tin Roof. It's on the Mummery Street. It's a hell of a party bar. Like Still to this day. Roof. You probably have we've Tin Roof. We've been to Tin spot. Roof, yeah. It's the spot. My dad went there every day. He was like the, like the bar father. You know what I mean? Like he would hang out in his booth and all the people that worked there would come holler at him and stuff. And uh, I went to go see him one day. And man, I was probably, I'm going to say, no bullshit, I'm going to say, right around your age now. I'm going to say 29. Um, 
and I go, man, I'm over it, dude. I've done all I can do. I've I've pushed this thing as far as I can. I'm making like thirty eight, forty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, and I'm spending it all just sleeping in the van and just chasing the next thing. It's cost me that much money to just stay alive and send money back to Bailey. I was like, I just feel like I'm failing as a father. And I'm just like spilling my problems on my father's a man of few words, polar opposite of me. Gangster. You know what I mean? Sitting there drinking his vodka. And when I'm when I'm when I'm done talking to him about it, he goes, All I'm gonna say is, Jason, is that if you would have put this same energy into being a brain surgeon, you would probably be on your sixth or seventh year of college right now. Why would you let yourself get that close? to your dream and not get there. And in his mind, he didn't know nothing about the entertainment business. He just looked at it like, there's no way you're working as hard as I'm watching you work. Yeah. And this thing doesn't pay off. If you'd have worked this hard at Vanderbilt university, you'd be finna get a doctor's degree in the next two years. Why would you jump off now? And that was the way he paralleled it to me. Cause he was like that dude at Vanderbilt's not making no money neither, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. he's two years away from having a doctor's degree. And I left there that day and I thought about that and it inspired me. And it was like one of them many of times he gave me talks like this, but it's the one I remember the most, you know what I mean? Of like putting an extra set of, you've said, we've all been there where you just need sure. a little, a little more wind in your uh -huh. sail. And there's that click. Just a little just more. You just needed go. somebody just to just let you know that, man, what you're doing is funny, Celine. Fuck everybody. It's going to work. It don't matter what scale it's working now. I promise you, you're funny. Your pranks are really good. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? It's like that happened to you at some point, I'm sure too, mm -hmm. right? That somebody came in and was like, yo, that shit's actually like, it could work. Mm -hmm. That was always my father, my mother, my brothers, sisters, my family, believe it or not, always was really like, never once. They were they were always like, if anybody will figure it out, it'll probably be you. But they also knew I had the eye of a tiger. You know what I'm saying? You grew up in the household. You could probably, they probably see something me I didn't even see, you know? But I didn't have uh, friends. I guess struggle. He's been my best friend for 20-something years. We've been making music together. We've been to jail together a few times, had a couple cases. We came from the streets to the music together. He always believed I was going to – he always believed it too. Yeah, man, that's – I don't know. I, your story is just fucking – it's dope. Like, yeah. Yeah, you're kind of like a modern day like preacher. Like you're like, <laughs> I don't know. You seem like an angel or something, dope, bro. Thank I you, swear baby. to God. But I mean, just everything about you too. It's so unique. Like even your look just doesn't make sense for to most country guys, right? You right. don't see anyone with your look. Yeah, for sure. So it's so unique and different. Yeah. I think, I think Steiny needs. Yeah, it a bear seems hug. like you went through these yeah. trials to like now you've gotten through it. And now you can help so many people with based on what you've been through and what you've learned, right? Yeah, Pretty that's cool. all. I, that's all I want to do, Cal. I just want to yeah. help. Like, like I just want to be a. I was um. I've been using this quote lately is, I don't want to be happy anymore. I want to be of service. I think, I, I can't remember who, I think I heard Shia LaBeouf say it. But it's like, it was such a concept to me of like, I'm even past the point of wanting to be happy anymore. Like, I just want to be useful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I just want to be of service. Like, I just want to make sure that I can, you know, I spent so many times tearing shit down and so many years being the part of the problem that now I just want to be as much a part of the solution as I can be. And I'm also conscious of it, too, because I know that how this game works is that people are only going to care what I have to say for a certain amount of time. And I want to make that time useful. You know, uh, my acceptance speech, most viral moment I ever had. Did y'all see it by chance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I talk about the yeah. windshield being bigger than the rearview mirror. Yeah. And, um, man, I'm looking up at that clock. And when you accept an award, there's a there's a big screen TV out there that's like just like the run of show shit. You know what I mean? And I looked up at it right after I held the trophy up and it said 58, 57. I was like, oh, I only got a minute. I was like, man, and in my first thought was like, you better say something that matters. That's what I'm telling myself. Like, you got a minute, boy. You better say something that matters. It might be the only time you ever get to stand up here. It might be the only award I ever win. Again, it might be the last award I ever win. You know what I mean? I was like, I got a minute here where the world might listen to what I got to say. I better say something to make a motherfucker feel good. You know what I'm saying? You know, I spent so many time behind the scene making people feel bad. It's like, I want to push, baby. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the shit I'm on these days, man. Yeah, Trying dude. to be a happy dad, dude. I can't imagine how many people you've inspired. Boy, like, I don't know, just a lot of people, right? Yeah. I hope to do that it again. I, you, when, I, when I drop this weight and get my shit straight, I hope to oh, get a whole new one. It's going to inspire a lot of people, too. I told Gary Breck, I was like, insane. man, I got a Chef Ian Larios. He works with a bunch of UFC guys. He helped Bilal cut for the uh, the fight, the Covington fight. I know Bilal didn't fight, but you know yeah, Bilal weighed in that backup, day in case yeah. he was the backup. So he went and cut him. He came from George Lockhart's camp. Uh, 
He's moving in with me next week. <sighs> That's so me between him and Brecker, dude, I think, man, y'all finna see, dude. I get back oh, on this yeah. pod later, dog. It's gonna be old. Skinny well, that's a roll. blessing too if you can have a chef that because he's gonna cook you tasty ass healthy. Yes. Food. that's a fucking blessing. <laughs> we have a sh- we have a chef too. She's kind of more just like a grandma. Yeah, she's kind of a shitty cook, but yeah, like, yeah her, <laughs> but like she's her she energy. Gets the job done. She's more here for her energy. She's like our mom. That's she's awesome. She's like a house mom. Yeah, <laughs> but it it definitely helps. That's a blessing. So that's gonna be key for you, hundred percent. Yeah, you talk about all uh, how much you love the rap game. What about like today's rappers? A collab you would ever do, or you would like a project you'd want to work on? Oh, dude, man, I love everybody, man. I love NLE Chopper. Uh, we talked a little bit. A big fan of his. Uh, Kevin Gates, Joyner Lucas, um, NBA Young Boy. Uh, yeah. I, man, I listen to everything. I listen to all the all the up and coming stuff. I love Dirk. You know, Dirk and Morgan do so much stuff together, though. I don't know if I could get in over You and there. NBA would be fucking yeah, right? so crazy. I fuck bro. with Young Boy, man. I've That'd always liked his music. His, his, uh, I love his melodies. I thought I think they're just so so incredible. I love that uh I love that whole era though. I love some of the new stuff that's happening. I think people think that people are giving hip hop a hard time right now. What do you what do you mean by that? Well, because you know, it didn't have I don't think it had a number one album this year. I think Drake's might have went number one. But yeah. um he's the goat. He's gonna go he's literally yeah, of course. the goat. He's is country like is country like Bigger than it's been. Country's in- is biggest and coolest it's ever been right now. Right. It's really it's a really cool moment to be in country music. I'm honored to be in the middle of the wave of what is country music right now. But Morgan Wallen is almost single handedly doing that. Him and Zach Bryan to me are doing it by themselves. Yeah. You know, as far as I'm concerned, they brought the national spotlight to the rest of us. We're all just trying to get get a little piece of that sunshine they brought over here. Yeah. But um yeah, it's Morgan's cool. a superstar, but his music's just like really good. It's so good. Like his music's fucking It's fire. so good. His yeah. voice is so good. His songs are yeah. so good. Morgan is a songwriter, dude. Yeah. His he, music he'll cut is outside good, songs, bro. but like his ear, his understanding, his songwriting, like he is He's a he's he's more brilliant. The streams give him the credit he deserves, but critically, he's more brilliant than he gets credit. I for. agree. Yeah, you know what I mean. He is truly brilliant, man. I've been in a room with him. He's he's special. Because to me, all this boils down to songwriting. Like, who can actually hold their weight? Like, if we cleared this room out right now, and I said I need two people to stand here and write a song with me, or one person to stand here and write a song with me, like that's when the rubber meets the road. Can we sit here and cook up something that actually matters? You know what I mean? And you find out who brings what to what rooms when you do that. Morgan's brilliant. You know what I mean? Because uh, I say this with love to my L.A. friends, but there's no harder town to cut your teeth in songwriting than Nashville. I've wrote in L.A. I've wrote with hip-hop dudes. I've wrote in New York. I've done all the writers' rooms, the pop rooms, the TV rooms. I'm a songwriter above everything. When I quit doing this... And we just all hang out and fish and get drunk together. And you're like, you should go do some shows. And I'm like, never. But I've been writing songs. Listen to this one. I'll always write songs. Mm -hmm. Long after I quit performing, long after I quit doing all that other stuff, I'll write songs forever. To me, that's the core of it. In Nashville, there's no place to write a song like that city, man. It's the best of the best. Just because everyone's there? Yeah, it's the fucking UFC of songwriting is the way to look at it. You know what I mean? Like, L.A., respectfully to me, is... I don't know. Don't, don't get me in trouble here. But, yeah, it's to me, it's the it's as big as... It, great songwriters in L.A., hit songwriters. But Nashville's different. Everybody knows it. Do the songwriters in Nashville write for all genres or mostly just country? Or are they writing, like, pop shit, too? They'll write pop shit sometimes, but they're normally just like writing for other country artists music. and shit. Yeah. They're the normally country just shit. writing country music, yep. Yeah. It's really cool, though, man. We'll go in there and write, like, I'll take a writing session with two other people, and we'll go write a song for another artist. Yeah. That's not even in the room. Yeah. You know I'll, what I mean? Have you done that really for, cool. oh, yeah, what, for sure? any songs that we would know? Yeah, we'll talk about it off camera. Okay, okay, yeah, cool. For sure. But do you decide? I'm not, I'm not, my credits are out there anyway, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'm not, like, I don't want to ever take away from do you decide, yeah. like, after the song, you're like, this would be good for this artist, or do you do that beforehand? Both ways is the cool thing. Sometimes people start writing, they'll have like a cheat sheet and a publisher will send and be like, hey, such and such is working on an album. Yeah. Or such and such is looking for a song that feels like. And you'll take that cheat sheet and be like, let's target write this. But some days you just write one and halfway through it, you're like, man, this would be really cool if such and such got on this. You know what I mean? You'll hear artists. Like I have my artist friends that are singer songwriters send me songs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh, my boy Hardy. I don't know if y'all ever heard yeah, of him. But he's, of he's the man, dude. He's fucking awesome, right? He sent me one the other day. He's like, I just can't not hear you on this. Let me know what you think about it. Like, it's just how songwriters, how we write. You That's know what dope. I mean? It's really cool. Would you say that, like, in this space, everyone's pretty supportive of each other, or it's still, like, you, everyone's competitive? Like, I think everybody's really supportive of each other. I, uh, and I don't want to cut you off, but I will say the one thing with country is it's unique because everyone's in Nashville. 
Yeah. Like in every other, everyone's spread out to the country. Yeah. Everyone's in one spot. No, we're all there. And, and country music has three major award shows a year that actually matter, like really matter, like nationally televised, big deals. Country music has, you know, tons of festivals, more festivals than any other genre as far as just music festivals. So it's such a community that not only does everybody live there, we're all doing the same media, we're all at the same award shows. Like, I know if I don't plan on seeing, like, Cody Johnson's a friend of mine. I'm just, I'm just like, picking a country dude here. Cody Johnson comes to mind first. Cody Johnson or Riley Green. We don't see each other much throughout the year. We talk a lot. We're all really good friends. But we know that whether we try to see each other, we don't have to try to see each other. We're going to see each other seven times this year no matter what. Yeah. We're going to see each other CMA week. We're going to see each other CMA fest. We're going to see each other ACM week. We're going to see each other CMT week. You know what I mean? Like, we're mm-hmm. going to see each other CRS week. Like, we know this. You know what I mean? So we plan our parties around it. And it's a really cool thing when you see that in the community. It's like the backstage at a country awards show. I'll tell you, listen, we'll talk about it after the Grammys because I'll get to see one of the other ones finally. But I'm willing to bet the backstage at a country one is way different than the backstage at one oh, of those. I bet. Yeah. We all fucking really know each other. You know what I mean? So it's really cool. That's dope. Um, how is How important is it when you, like, met your wife and she came into your life? besides the birth of my daughter, the second single most important event in my life was meeting my wife. Um, nobody would have ever been able to like, nobody's seen in us what we've seen in each other. And I think that's what makes our love so special was I looked at her and I knew that she was more than what she was in that moment. I don't know if you know the story, but we're open about it. My wife at the time was an escort, a high end escort in Vegas. Um, she grew up in Vegas and at the time I was, you know, $500 shows living in that white van. You know what I mean? I didn't know. I didn't have a key to an apartment. I just let my little, little place go. I mean, I was down on my, you know, I was trying to figure it out. I was regrouping in life and I looked at her and I didn't see that though. I was like, I see a woman that's like really could do something. Like I see a woman that could be a brand. I see a woman that could be a boss. I see a woman that could run a business. Like I seen that in her, you know what I mean? And she looked at me, and at that time, I've been wrote off. Every record label on earth said no twice. You know what I'm saying? Like, big part of the Jelly Roll story, they said no like a motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it's here I am putting out independent records, and I'm just trying to find my way and find my sound. And she looks at me, and we're early into our dating phase, and she's like, you're going to be a superstar. She's like, you don't realize how much your music's going to touch people. You know what I mean? Like, this was one of our early encounters. You know what I mean? And I just remember nobody, nobody's seen that in her. Nobody's seen that in me. But we seen it in each other. You know what I mean? Like, we seen that in each other. So, like, the fact that she has, I don't know, 50, 60, 70,000 Patreon subscribers for her podcast it doesn't surprise That's me. That's amazing. 70,000? Yeah, yeah wow. 70,000. That's really yeah, she's got a fucking real. She's got a real thing. That's she does fucking a dope. TV show on her Patreon. You know what I mean? She's she's huge. She does millions of downloads a month on her podcast. I mean, she's crazy. I'm, I'm gonna talk to John about her soon because yeah. like her shit is insane. Uh, her TikTok What's the is pod, huge. The dumb, the dumb blonde, dumb blonde podcast. Pod, yeah. yeah, y'all check it out. We'll she's put the hilarious. link in the description. But um, she's um, yeah, she's she's just such. She's so brilliant. You know what I mean? And it's like, but it doesn't. It didn't surprise me. I knew it. You know what I mean? Like, man, we used to joke all the time. She'd take these sexy pictures for the internet because it was IG the thought era. Mm-hmm. Remember that era? You know what I mean? And Wait, I, I'm that, leaning in on it. Is that, like, yeah, that era, has is that era still around? It, yeah, that's oh, yeah. that's how on, I know bro. I'm old. <laughs> I partook Definitely back still. then. Yeah, that's still I hot. partook back then. And uh, I would tell her, I'd be like, dude, I'm telling you, you'd get more attention if you just just like get on there and talk. You know what I mean? Because I just knew how funny she was. She's so intimidating because she is cool. Y'all seen her, right? Yeah. Bad. She's she's like beautiful, Barbie, yeah. Right, like 100% yeah. like just undeniable like bad bitch you know what i mean and uh but i was like but what you don't know about her is now you know because she's so big on tiktok and she's goofy as fuck <laughs> bunny is goofy like me like she's silly you know what i mean like in a in a gentle like genuine way and i was like this is the stuff that the world would go crazy it's kind of the jelly roll thing like i don't look like i would be this jovial i don't look like i could sing good neither so i have two things going for me i'm i'm at relatively jovial guy and i got a decent voice two things you didn't see coming i was like they're never gonna see you being like awesome like, just go be yourself. And when she leaned into that shit, man, it's like, yeah, sorry I went on that tangent, but I just fucking love her, dude. No, it's and dope. I'm high. I got high with Celine before this podcast. I'm talking oh, yeah. too much. Dude, that's another showing your girl. That's dope. How, how dope does it, like, feel to find a girl that, like, like she's just, like, the one? Oh, dude. That must be dope. 
It's such a good feeling. And when your world shrinks. I'm serious. I know. When your world shrinks, dude, you found one? You got your one, Stanley? No, I'm still looking for that, uh, for the one. No, we're all still, we're all still Wait, looking. That's why I'm asking, because I'm like, I'm Sorry. trying to get advice, too. No, it's a real thing, yeah. man. It's like. So, how long you been together? I can only imagine, Kyle, how successful you'll be when you find the one. <laughs> it's just so hard. Though. No, no, it scares me because. But it's also about you, timing, too, right? Yeah, it's all about timing. But it scares me because, man, you have done so incredible with your mind scattered about birds everywhere. That when you focus on one bird and that's all that matters, dog, you're gonna fucking like be the next Donald Trump or some shit, dude. You're gonna be like the next <laughs> president of Canada if you want to yeah. be or something like. I that. might, I might do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I might, ha I might have to. All I might jokes, have to pull I'm a Trump and say like Canada being, one day. Like I'm being for real because that's <laughs> yeah. what happened to me. My world shrunk. Like all of my focus and attention was like I didn't realize how you don't even now you don't think you put a lot of time and energy into chasing pussy. No, we we've been talking about that. You know what I'm saying? Saying? <laughs> but <laughs> if you look at your text message, just little no it's little brain so cycles true, bro. of just waste that you know is a waste. That's all just like I'm trying to tell Steiny that too. Yeah. Especially when you don't get it done too. Oh yo, God <laughs> forbid you run out and chase something around and end up stuck Fuck, in the front door with a good night. I invested night three weeks into this fucking bullshit. You know, could have put that time elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. When you really think about how much time you waste just chasing pussy, that, that's when I got in shape is when I just said, yo, for the next four months, I'm not going to chase pussy. I'm just going to focus on this. Are you still just drinking once a week? Yeah, Good. once a week. If maybe even like less. Like this month, I have a calendar in my room, and I just yeah. like, we have to do something in South Carolina. We have to do something in Toronto. Right. And I just mark it two X's on the calendar. Right. And besides that, yeah. if there's nothing crazy going on, I'm not just going to go out. How cool is it to be in a situation, I think about this all the time, to be in a situation in life where you look at work like, oh, got to gotta work that day, so I'm drinking. Exactly. It's like the opposite of every other job <laughs> on is, earth, yeah, exactly. where you look at days and go, oh, well, I didn't want to drink today, but I do have to work. Yeah, you know or if it's just like, now it's just like I've been doing it for so long, and it's like, it's got to be something cool. Like, yeah. we're going to go to South Carolina for Happy Dad and do like yeah. a cool event there. Like, I haven't been there. What part? Uh, I think we're going to go everywhere around the state. And just like do it like y'all did Texas when y'all yeah, just yeah, do through, that. just ripped through the whole state. Yeah, so cool shit like that. But then besides that, I'm trying to just gains diet. You see that March 9th um, competition that we're doing? Are y'all doing like it? a physique competition for March 9th? So we're like dialed. For the we next, got all like, our just the really? note boys. So us, yeah. Steve, Gabe, ain't that the Gambles. night of the fight? Yeah. Okay. So that day we're all gonna do like whoever. So this makes... way y'all can party that night. Oh, we're done, yeah. Because y'all what y'all oh, done the physique. Yeah, Stein's yeah, not yeah. really in it no more. No, I'm in it. You already dropped out, Stein. I'm in it, bro. I just don't post my shit all day every day. <laughs> I want a sneak attack. You know what I mean? Like no one's expecting yeah. me when I fucking win that bitch. That's <laughs> awesome. Who y'all think's gonna win? Salim's pretty dialed. I'm dialed right now. So Are you perfect. really? Ooh, perfect. Oh, this makes me happy. I thought great. about joining Burt. Burt Kreischer's trying to do a 5K in May. Is he? I swear, he's, that's his thing. Him and Tyler. We're doing a 5K Five by May. Miles. Like, Burt wants to do like a 5K by May. That's three and a half miles, right? Am I tripping? Uh, yeah. Is it three and a half? I think it's more. What? So you just have to run three miles? Yeah. But you, Bert's you trying to get. I, well, I got a little worse to do that. By May? Yeah, that's like by for May. You, bro. No, by May for sure. Five but months? I thought about hitting him like, yeah, five Wait, months. Like, you're going to be so running. You can run Are a fucking, you gassing you me up right now? You can run a fucking half a marathon by May. Let me do it. Gas me up. You got the chef coming. You got the chef coming. Bert. You should Bert, post it too. Bert and Tom Segura, it's official. I'm joining y'all for the the five K of May. Fucking Kyle said it, it's done. You should, you should post it. Five months. Yeah. You got that. I've been walking every morning. I'm feeling good, dude. I'm walking like two miles every morning, two you and a half miles it. every morning. You should definitely post it. That's how he got me to do it. Like he told me to post it. When he well, now you announced it, so now you have no. Yeah, choice. that's why I did. It. That's yeah. why I looked straight to catch my camera in it. It's eight okay. miles, bro. Yeah. No, a five K is no, eight miles. Three. Oh God, that damn. Fucked. Fuck you, Stein. He scared the shit out of me. I was like, I just, Bert and Tom, I take it back. I was nah, to do three. three. Yeah, dude. So when did you know she was the one? When I met her. What moment? When we first met at the bar and hugged. The first meeting? I swear. And we Damn. didn't we didn't end up talking. She had a dude then, so we didn't chat. You Love it for a It's a real thing, bro. I I'm swear it was a real you. thing. But how do you do that when I you know it. she's with when she has somebody else that didn't kill your I knew enough about the situation that I had a I had a leverage up. Like, I knew kind of who she was and what her story was, and I knew who he was and what his story was. <laughs> so I had just enough of the lowdown to be like, oh, yeah, this is like... It was a very violent relationship, and I knew that. It was, like, notoriously violent. So I, I instantly was like, why would that girl be with that? You know, like, I couldn't figure that part out anyways. Like, she didn't look like the kind of woman... Because some women... I don't want to say that, but, like, some women are in arbitrary relationships, and that's kind of their thing. 
which is still a problem. They should, you know what I mean? Like they should ne- well, never be abused and they should, that's a deeper rooted issue. But she didn't look like the kind of woman that was like wanted to be in an abusive relationship. You know what I mean? You know, you kind of observed it. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately. I could just feel it. I, I feel the energies, man. Like I know. Mm. Energy is a real thing. Yeah, It's a real thing. It's a good so energy it's a real in this room, thing. right? Yeah. It's a great energy okay. in this room. Yeah. It feels good. I was worried about you because you've had some rough runs on the pod with different people. <laughs> So I was like, I wonder if tiny has got good energy. But when I hugged you, I was like, he feels like a great kid, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I'm two for two with that today, yeah, actually. Yeah, see? Yeah. Like, so know, what, you, could just ju- you could tell by the hug. Yeah, but, I mean, I want to feel your energy. And, and I can also, it's not about how much you embrace neither, because I know everybody's not a hugger. I'll still feel your energy if you're not a hugger. I know some people will be a little stiff, and I'm like, oh, they're just not a hugger. But you can just feel, I don't know, it's an exchange of energy. Yeah. I feel like anytime we get this close to each other, you start to really feel there's a thing in the room that happens, you know? Yeah. Especially in these settings because you're coming in to talk about real life stuff real and shit. shit and chat a little bit and there's cameras everywhere. So it's a it's a it's a whole different approach walk. This you really feel the energy in these rooms. Because you walked into right? something where you walked in and sat right down, I was like, they don't want to be here. Yeah. Y'all we've all done them. We've all done media. Y'all might not have. Y'all been on fire a long time. But I spent a lot of time not on fire. And you'd walk into places and be like, I don't really there nobody's into this. This is on autopilot. Yeah. I didn't feel that. As soon as I walked in, I was like, This is a cool situation. Dude, I wish we could go back and see one of the fifty dollar shows, like experience that. Yeah, come to Nashville. We'll do a bar night. We'll go out and get drunk, and we'll sing at the bar for fun. I'd be down. Fuck, yeah. we might have to come. Fun. What are you doing this weekend? Come on, are y'all coming this weekend? <laughs> we could. I'm in town. I've really? never been to Nashville. Yo, yes. Should we come out? I've never Saturday? been. We'll just do it one night Saturday. Yeah, one, I'll do one, one night. Sat- I'll okay. take y'all out on a Saturday. We'll fucking rage, dog. We'll get IVs set up the next day. It'll be a hoot and a half. It's a thing. Dude, we're talking about our health grind, though. Yeah. No, but it's one send a week. Yeah. yeah, we could have one. Yeah, yeah. one send a week. Okay, fine. Only if, I'll, I'll participate so maybe we'll in the fly sand. In, maybe we'll fly in Friday night. Saturday we'll rip a fucking early morning workout. And then we'll have a country day, and then we'll go out. At we'll night. have a country day. We'll go wrap some four wheelers and, we'll, and fuck off. We'll drink all. at night, and then that night we'll go hit the honky tonks, and we'll play some songs. We'll get up there I'm and sing. Some, you know any country music? I know some Morgan. I like Chris Stapleton. Oh, he's Chris the Stapleton's pretty good. He's the absolute god. <laughs> yeah, uh, Morgan's good. Yeah, um, but yeah, mostly Morgan. Yeah. Mostly what about Morgan. you, Stiney? Yeah, I I used to like Florida Georgia Line a lot. Yeah, that's when I kind of got into it, like 2016. They had some bangers. They had some real bangers. Yeah, Morgan uh, up down was one of his first big ones with them. That's and a fun. My buddy hot. Ernest I'll wrote some you. of that stuff with him and Morgan and Hardy early in that stuff. Big friends with Tyler and BK. They're good guys. Cole Swindle and what's a uh, love I, Cole. I just have it all over my fucking love Cole. Yeah, when Cole won the East ACM this year for the, uh, I never get to tell these stories. When Cole won the ACM for the uh, uh, Heads Carolina song this year. We were down in uh, Austin, Texas, and I went to the mothership two nights before the night before the award show and got wrecked, like wrecked at Kill Tony. I went to Kill Tony with Tony Hinchcliffe. Yeah. Or it might have been a Ron White show, actually. And then I went Monday for Kill Tony and got wrecked. And uh, we were down there fucking off, and I went to, so that night of the ACMs, we go out and party, and the last party I went to was Cole Swindles, and I showed up. I don't remember hardly being there, but I just remember Cole being on top of the fucking world, man. Yeah. He's a great dude, man. Um, you know any country music? Uh, Morgan's my favorite. Who else do I listen to? We'll you know, sing some Morgan. Sleeper, I like that. Morgan, I like uh, we'll Mitchell Morgan. Tenpenny's music. He's the best. His music's and he's the fire. Homie. He's from Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. He's from my city. I, we him, hung with him, him before. It's like a sleeper one. I think his music's like really good. So, really good. So good, man. His uh, yeah. his voice is unbelievable. And uh, the big chorus, pray, pray, oh, hey, all his, all his songs are fire. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, he's, um, I don't fuck with bitches no more. Yeah, you had the bitches song. I love all the Tim Penny stuff. Yeah, his shit's good. Yeah, he's, if he's in town, we'll get him to go out and rip with us. But yeah, we'll yeah. get out and have some drinks. And we'll, it's called a sit in. So, like the old cowboys in the 70s, is from what I learned the term, like Waylon and them would go to like the Ryman Auditorium is. In the alley against Tootsie's, which is the world's most famous honky tonk in the world, it's the original honky tonk, which connects to Layla's and a place called Roberts, which I'll take y'all to all these little spots. These are the honky tonks on Broadway. You've probably been, but I'll show you the history of them. But that alleyway connects to the artist entrance of the Ryman Auditorium, the historic Ryman, the mother, the mother church of country music. And uh, these stories were these guys would leave the Ryman and they'd get drunk going to Tootsie's and whatever band was in there, they'd say... Let, let, you know, they just, you mind if we sit down? And they called it a sit-in. So, like, Waylon Jennings would be, like, at a honky-tonk on a Thursday night just off, and him, like, comedy, like how comics go in and work out their set. Yeah. 
Like they just go into these bars and take over. Crazy. And just play music. So imagine being a Saturday night and you're just watching some house band play and then fucking Waylon Jennings shows up. You know what I mean? And you're watching Waylon Jennings sing like his favorite Buck Owens song. You know what I mean? It was just a different era. So we try to keep that spirit alive. And a few times a year, we'll get drunk, go down to Broadway and hit every bar and sing. That's fucking, That's fucking cool. cool. I'll be, yeah. so we I'm down. Yo, it's it's, easy, right? I've never been to Nashville. It's a so. ball, dude. It's mad different. It, yeah. You have a girl opening for you right now, Jesse? Or am I wrong? Is Jesse Murphy? Oh, open? Jesse Murphy. Yeah, no, we did a song you? together. She didn't open for me. She did. You heard that record, <laughs> The Wild Ones? Oh, she's she, so yeah, good. she's all over my TikTok. Yeah, she's huge, man. Y'all check it out. She's really she's 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 special, man. She's like my little sister. Yeah, she just did the Jingle Balls with me, and she did New Year's Eve. She did Dick Clark with us. She came out. She comes out anytime she can to do the Wild Ones with us. She's nineteen, right? Yeah, she just turned nineteen. Jesus. Yeah, it's cool. One of my fun moments where I think I kind of became a fan because my daughter. I heard her voice, and I asked my daughter, I was like, "Are you hip to this kid? Of this voice?" And she was like, "Yeah, she's young. She's my age." And then Bailey showed me her TikTok. And I think that's kind of how it all launched out. So she's wow. really, really, she is a different kind of talented. Um, I tell this story very openly. She, I invited her to come sing at one of my shows because I love when, like, I love covering songs and stuff. It's just like a passion. Like, I just love music, whatever. Yeah. I just love it. And I was like, yo, let's do Simple Man by uh, Skinnerd. We'll do the Shinedown version of it, though, because I just got off tour with Shinedown. So I was just in the routine of singing it anyways. And I, what I really wanted to see was how that voice worked in person because when you hear her on tiktok that voice is so distinct and smoky and just so draws you in i was like i wonder if she's hurting her voice trying to sing so i wondered how she sang it like at what level man pitch perfect that girl is phenomenal i mean everything about to be that young and have that much of an understanding of what she wants she's gonna do whatever she could she could be like our uh, our next amy winehouse or something crazy wow Damn. Yeah. She could be big. I mean, dude, she's 19. Yeah, it's fucking. You know what I mean? Bizarre. It's the same way I look at y'all being all young and shit. Dude, I'm old, man. I'm going to do this a few more years and retire just as soon as I got famous. You know what I mean? Like, y'all are going to have long runs. Like, she's going to have a long run. What, what's your favorite cover to do? Probably old time rock and roll, just because it's the song that kind of got it all started for me as you far ever, as singing. Do you ever try, like, could you do any, like you said, you, okay, so you did Hard Out Here for a Pimp. Could you do, like, Mask Off Future? Yeah. What, oh, dude, all the future tapes, man. I, uh, did you see the mixtape? You're a hip hop kid. Yeah. Did you see the mixtape Mount Rushmore? Was that is that future? No, no. Did you see what they said about it? So they said oh, who were okay, the four no. biggest faces. But who said this? No, I forgot. It was like a hip hop vlog site. This was a huge argument on the internet a month ago. Okay, who? What's on? It, it? was future. He has to be Jeezy. Um, Wayne. I'm trying to remember who the fourth was because the fourth one wasn't Gucci. Gucci has to and be And I on remember there. people arguing if, if it should have been Gucci or not. And I thought for sure it was Gucci. He's got the most mixtapes ever. Somebody said the coolest thing about Gucci and Jeezy. We were talking about this. I don't know. Fuck, I can't believe I'm talking this open with y'all. We were talking about mixtape eras. and how Did you we were you a part of this era at all? You little bit, dude. Ever? I was on Dap Hip. So, like, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. on that. So, like, I think Gucci had the longer, more consistent run. I think Jeezy had the bigger individual moment. Because Trap or Die ended up being such a classic mixtape. To me, it was like the beginning of that, like mixtapes being like album, like consumed like albums. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. that's my thing is I think Gucci had a longer run and a more consistent run, but I think that... Dude, Gucci has, people forget, Gucci has fucking mixtapes with Drake features that no one has even heard. Dude. Like he has, I used to listen to a lot of yeah. that. And to me, we're still talking about second no matter what. Nobody. Oh, 50. They were talking about 50. 50 was the fourth one. Because you remember 50 had that big wild mixtape run right before Get Richard Die Trying. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Well, Get that Richard Die Trying is like the best. I think that's the most the timeless album. album ever. It's top five albums yeah. ever, period. Yeah. yeah. Especially in hip hop for arguably the best. You can one listen ever. to that shit today and it bangs just yeah. as hard. Bangers. Yeah. Yeah, it, 100%. Anytime I hear many men, I still just get goosebumps yeah. into my armpit. Heat's a hard <laughs> you know one, too. Many men's a slapper. Uh, Heat's a hard one, too, by 50. Yeah. Did you, we were there. talking about 50 Cent mixtape era. Do you remember his mixtape era? I didn't really listen to 50 as much. I listen to him now more. Yeah, like How to Rob the Industry yeah, but era. Back then, I was like, I was pretty much a kid. I wasn't really, but my brothers and like sisters listened to it. So. Yeah. It was but different. But now I'm listening to everything that he was making back then, but. The cool thing about where I'm at in age is I got to see all these mixtape errors in real time. None of them were as hard as Wayne. Nah. Well, he has Beer. no ceilings, and then he has 
What, I don't know whether mixtapes, but No Ceilings was crazy. For well. sure. Um, he did. I forgot what the drama. What was the drama? Gangsta Grills. He did a lot with DJ Drama. He did so many of those Gangsta Grills. But yeah. he just, it, it, to this day, his biggest records to me were the mixtape records. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the records that went off in the clubs in the South, especially, were all that mixtape era. That, I, I, I stole all Bro, that. That was by some the of the way. best rap ever. Yeah. Future, st- Gucci, and Wayne. For sure. I stole all that, Future's by the way. Future's goat, too. Yeah. And applied Future's it. one of the Future's goats. mixtape goat, for sure. <laughs> that guy's crazy, man. 100%. I took, I wanted to put out music like a hip-hop artist, tour like a rock and roll artist, and write songs like a country artist. Because for me, it was easier that way. I watched the hip-hop dudes. Nobody put out more music than a rapper. To this day, they are the best at creating content and mm-hmm. consistency of music. If you looked at music like content in your business, yeah. nobody does it better than a rapper. Nobody tours better than a rock and roll artist. Every time you look up, a rock and roll artist is fucking gone again. You know what I mean? Like, a rock and roll dudes do 150, 200 dates a year, no problem. Man, the singer-songwriter, the, 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 the songwriters in Nashville are doing 200 songs a year. They're writing 200 songs a year. Like, literally. I wrote 80 last year and with my schedule. Damn. You know so when what you mean? say 80, is it like 80 that you like submitted somewhere or just like? No, I'll, send, that I'll submit some to my publisher to pitch to other artists to see like if somebody around town wants to cut the records. Um, but mostly just trying to write to figure out what yeah. the new sound is. Yeah. Yeah. I write like that every time. So the, I, my goal was I put out 13 songs in 23. I want to put out like 30 in 24. So for me to have the right 30, I, the game of numbers for me is I'll probably write 120. How do you decide what to put out? Do you run it by other people? Yeah, 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 man. You're in, you're you're now stuck in the jelly roll fold. Okay, you'll get I'm songs. Down. I'm down. You'll get songs. It's gonna get happen. some Dropbox folders. Yeah, you'll get some Dropbox folders, man. Because you know okay. what I do? I do SoundCloud links, okay. private ones, and I'll tell you why. Because I you don't if you want to tell me what you think about it, I want you to. Like I encourage your input, but don't feel obligated. I'm gonna see what you're listening to, anyways. Yeah, I don't get that analytic on Dropbox. Oh, because there's oh okay, I see. See on uh, SoundCloud, I can look and see what songs are playing the most. So you ain't got to call and go, hey man, that song number seven's banging. And I'll look and see it's got seven hundred plays compared to this one. You know what I mean? It's really mm-hmm. cool, and not just y'all. I mean, everybody gets the same link, but that's how I start picking singles. That's I didn't that's how I picked that. "Son of a Sinner" for my first country radio single. Really, well, really, yeah. We just sent it to we sent the Dropbox link to everybody. I mean the SoundCloud link, and that's the song everybody kept going back to. Why do you do you get worried that somebody might not keep it real with you? Yeah, you gotta. You know, it's hard to be honest, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's hard to be honest and um, critique somebody, especially when you're not in that world. Yeah. Because I could imagine, but you don't. That means the most to me, though. If you or Cal or one of y'all tell me something about one of my songs you don't like, that would mean a lot to me because you got the ear I want. Mm. You're the ear I'm. You're the ear I'm going for. But imagine, I could also imagine you sitting at your house going, "What fucking business do I have telling a fucking award winning artist? Right. I think the fucking bridge sucks." Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Uh-huh. You know what I mean. But it's like that means a lot to me because that's who I'm writing for. You know what I mean. I'm writing for that. So that's why. Yeah, I'll start sending songs out in small packages. I'll send you like three or four. And then, because if you send somebody the album all at once, they might miss a good song because another song was better. You know what I mean? So I'll send songs. But yeah, I play my wife, my daughter, Bailey. Boy, she's my biggest critic. Man, my 15 year old dude will light my ass on fire, dude. She'll fry me. <laughs> she'll talk so much shit to me, dude. She'll just be like, she'll be like make fun. They'll like, they'll like make me mad almost. Like they'll carry it too far sometimes. About the music? Yeah, yeah. About you, ever, you ever got yeah. your feelings? Yeah. Like yeah. you actually ever got your feelings hurt by what? No. No, no, no. no. But no. you snapped him and like, yo, you don't know what you're Have talking you about. You're just a kid. Yeah, no, 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 never. That's <laughs> 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 you fucking dumbass. No, no, never. But she has, you know, she you would it's funny, man. She'll lay into it. That's awesome. Y'all love her, dude. She's different. She's like, um, she's me and my wife had custody for eight or nine years, and how I am in this room is how I am in life. So, like, you know, best story I tell about my daughter is go back to that state championship game. I'm pulling up, Kyle, and I'm calling her phone, but I, I'm old, so I go, hey, Siri. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Like, because I'm just whatever. That's a dad mom Yeah, it's thing. a dad thing, right? Yeah. I know I'm old. Fuck, thanks, Tiny. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, Siri, FaceTime Bailey Ann, you know? And I had forgot that she had got a new number. And I got it under Bailey Ann New. So she didn't answer, so I called her friend. Now I'm sidelined at this football game, but all, you know, on the on the field. And she answers the phone. She goes, like, what is taking you so long? I go, where are you? She goes, in the bleachers? Where are you? And I was like, on the field. And she was like, I was like, I was like, you need to come. And I was getting I was a little frustrated. I was like, why are you not answering my call? She's like, you haven't called me. 
And I was like, whatever. I was like, come over here. She's like, whatever, asshole. She says that to me and hangs up the phone. And when she's walking over, I'm getting madder. I'm like, why is she being so confident that I didn't just call her 20 times? And it was me. I fucked up. So when she gets up, she's like, what are you being such an asshole about? I was like, look at that. And she was like, wrong number. I was like, I'm so sorry that I'm having to apologize. But like, I love that we had the kind of relationship I wasn't mad at her because I knew her, you know, her confidence was like, she could tell she was just happy I was calling. She's like, what are you doing? You know, but just to show you how she is in general. So yeah, that same kid will be like, this song sucks. And then she'll tell me why the lyric sucks. She'll be like, you know how corny that lyric is? She's like, it makes you sound 48. <laughs> <laughs> and when I walked up to her that day, I said, everybody at your school's been talking about how I look too young to be your dad. She says, that's crazy. They keep telling me you look too old for the music you make. <laughs> that's what kind of asshole I have as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to parents. They know boys. to talk shit. Yeah. Damn. Maybe one time just double down and check her. Right. Like, yo, you didn't tell me you were changing your number. You know, you, yeah. can't, you <laughs> can't submit that easily, bro. <laughs> I changed her number. That's yeah. the problem. Oh, fuck. This well, was, a, this was an the all L. me moment. Yeah, yeah you gotta take the a, L. Yeah, this was an all me moment. <laughs> how, how much of the social media stuff are you, like, do you t pay attention to of, like, what's going on? And Not much. No. No, I, I'm a YouTube guy. So if it's on YouTube and I see it, I'll see it. But, you know, I'm pretty much stuck on YouTube. I'll scroll through Instagram or whatever, but it's just not my thing. Do you, have, do you ever read all the love that you get in your DMs? Yeah, um, sometimes, sometimes. I, I just, I don't, I'm in a fragile place mm -hmm. in my changing of my life right now. So I'm kind of cutting out outside things. Yeah. Just because I don't need a lot of voices in you my don't life need all right at this input. moment. Yeah, I don't need a lot of. I need really, I'm trying to make some big decisions here. You know what I mean? And uh, I want to change my life. I want to get healthy. I want to live longer. I want to be happy. I want to feel better. I want to be of service. And sometimes you catch the love, but you'll catch that other shit too. You know what I mean? And I just don't care for it. It's not nothing. I'm all, I'm at peace with however it shakes out. I need to, I'm just fragile. I just need to work. Yeah, with I would me agree. Right Especially when you have that vision of something that you want to do. Yeah. You don't really need it to listen to yeah. all those other opinions, right? Because it's game time for me. I don't feel like I'm sitting here. I feel like I'm sitting here with a lot to prove. Even the year I had, like, as blessed as I was with the award and the Grammy nominations and the sold-out arena tour and all that stuff, I still sit here like a man that feels like there's a lot of people that don't think I can do it again. Yeah. And that's no, a, that crazy, kind of bro? a healthy place for me to be. No that's matter good, what, though. you're always going to have people fucking doubting you and trying to take you down no matter what you accomplish. Yeah, you change your whole crazy. life and do it. Man, somebody, I, the quote I live by, though, is they said uh, they could watch Jesus walk on water today and they'd say it's because he can't swim. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, to me, that's just it. But it's, you know, it, it get, it's, I'm in a good place where it's like I know whatever song, I, whatever group of songs I put out next will determine if I do this for the next 10 years or the next two. Right. I know that. You know what I mean? Like, it's different. It's a lot, right? It's different. Y'all's business is different, dude. You know what I mean? Y'all can have a week where you don't put out a hit. You know what I mean? On here. You know what I mean? You can miss a hit here and there. You just got to come back with a hit. Yeah, music like, is tough, right? It's tough, man. I got I got a real big go. Like, when we come out here and uh, do these, I'm doing it off cycle, but when we come back and do the album thing, when an artist is in here talking to y'all about their album, man, they're betting their whole career on that week. They're betting their entire career every single time. We're betting our whole career on that album week. You know what I mean? Because it determines where we land at for the next until we drop again. Yeah. I know. That's tough. Wow. Scary, that's true. Man. I mean, that is a huge <coughs> difference. Like, we could put up another YouTube video two weeks later and make a quick comeback, but... For sure. Yeah, you, it's okay to it's okay to have a bomb. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, it's, we can but, get away with them here and there. Yeah, it's like, we're okay to have it songs that don't work. you bomb, but yeah, you, can, you can recover yeah. quicker. Yeah, you, we're in a place where it's like, I can have a couple songs, that, and I know every song of my album is not for everybody anyways. But I can have a few that don't connect. But when that album finally rolls out, man, they're better. I bet if I, if the first few I put out didn't connect, the album better have a smoker on it. You know what I mean? Or I'm fucking in a, quite a spot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> a bit of a pickle here, you know? But was, And I'm in that moment. So I'm in album mode right now. So I'm super fragile. So I ain't fucking with that internet right now. Yeah. Go gas me out it's, of my dude, spot. There's nothing on there right now anyway. Yeah, I went to go see myself get roasted on New Year's whenever they lit me up for the, the New Year's performance. Oh, I missed that. No, it was just a small thing on Twitter. We talked about it. It was just funny to me because, you know, I got it. There was like 25 million people watching that. Like, it's that big of no, a thing. No, but people were throwing shade. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. But imagine if you didn't know me from the man on the moon and you didn't like country music mm -hmm. or my style of anything. And to keep in mind, they don't know anything about me. 
So they're just like, who in the fuck yeah, is, is this guy? morbidly obese man? And they thought I was rapping because the first song I did was Halfway to Hell. But I'm a county jail revival. Yeah. It's, I'm not rapping, but it was still, once again, the box, the genre thing. You know what I mean, motherfuckers? To somebody, that was rap. You know? yeah. Like some, to some country dude, I'm not country. Somebody out there thinks I'm a rapper right now. You know what I'm saying? To watch the Dick Clark, but I haven't rapped in ten years. You know what I'm saying? It's just crazy. You like know? your action Bronson or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah like that's yeah. yeah. I got mistaken for him for so many years till he <laughs> lost weight, and we're finally just. I joke with him about that all the time. I'm like the whole. I always, people would always say you're like the Southern Action Bronson. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, funny. Yeah. I was like, it's kind of accurate though. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Y'all had action on here yet? I hadn't seen him on here. No, I don't, I don't, we haven't done action bronze. He's a hoot like and a half, dude. That'd be dope. He's fucking, he's a ball, man. I did his cooking show, and it was like, I, I probably showed up too high to be there, but it was just <laughs> high enough to be there, kind of. But instantly, I was like, this is crazy. But he shoots his show so loose. We just walked in. He's cooking and talking shit. And I was like, well, I'm finna roll. He's like, see you later. And they just kept filming. You know what I'm saying? It was like, <laughs> it was the wild. It was so awesome. That's, That's dope. dope. Yeah. So what else you got next? Grammys? Grammys, man. Grammys and um, Grammys and first week of February, February fourth. Tune in, y'all. Uh, best new CBS. artist nomination. Best new artist. Um, How does that feel? Best country collab. It's unreal. It's man, and especially being from the country music genre, like anytime one of us gets nominated in the all genres category, it's like a big deal for the whole city, kind of. So like the amount of love I got from Nashville for that nomination was really special. Who else is nominated? Um, Noah Khan, who I think probably deserves it frankly i think he probably did a little more than me this year um i'm also just a fan you know what i mean like i thought zach bryan was just as dessert probably more deserving than me of the new artists from the cmas but noah ice spice um coco jones ice spice is there too ice spice is there warren treaties one on which are friends of mine they're they're nashville people too i feel bad that i'm not thinking of the other two off top right now I sh i'm blowing it i feel embarrassed but i i know those four for sure do you, is that Once like a again, big thing for you? Obviously, obviously, it's a big thing to win a Grammy, but like, if you don't win, is it like... Man, I don't think I'm going to win. And I'm just walking in there in that mentality, which is not the mentality they told me to walk in with, but I just, that's how I walked into the CMAs and, it, you know, I just don't... I'm such a fan. I don't think I'm going to win because I think Noah's so good. You know what I mean? It's just a fan in me. You know what I mean? Now, I hope secretly Noah's somewhere thinking Jelly's so good. I hope he wins. You know what I mean? But he probably yeah. don't even know who I am. But it's like... That's my mentality walking in. I can say not winning. I'm always going to be a Grammy-nominated artist, so that's cool. Yeah. But, Cal, if I win. That's dope. Man, that's sauce. Can we daydream for a second? Can you imagine if my story ends up being that the year of my 40th birthday, I won New Artist of the Year. I won a fucking Grammy for the new artist. I'll be the, I'll be the second oldest one to ever win it. And the oldest person, I forgot who it was, but they were like 40 or 41. They were only like 10 months older than me when they won it. So like, it would just, I don't know. I think it's a Cinderella story to a degree. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. obviously I'm cheering for myself a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I'd love to win one, but you know, I could tell you this where I'm going to cry. Yeah. Like a baby. I mean, that's, it's, um, I don't know if y'all know what the Grammys mean, but, let me explain it to you from an artist's perspective. You can win VMAs, CMAs, MTV Music Awards, ACM, CMTs. You can win Billboard Music Awards. You can win all these different things that uh, acknowledge us as musicians, right? You can win all that. And the day you get just nominated for a Grammy, just nominated for a Grammy, not even winning one, you are no longer, that's not your intro. Like, your intro would be, like, right now, my intro would be, uh, before I was Grammy nominated, was uh, CMA New Artist of the Year, Jelly Roll. Now, if you look at the, when I went to that college, back to that state game, the next day, the, the newspaper up there put me on the front page for being at the game. Grammy. And it said, Grammy nominated, you got it, said Grammy nominated artist Jelly Roll. Like, just being Grammy nominated, Cal, meant more to that newspaper publication than me winning four C three CMTs, four People Choice Awards, and one CMA. That's what I won last year. Humbly, not bragging, just yeah. can't believe it. But that's the truth of my year. I won three CMTs, four People Choices, and one CMA. And the headline was Grammy nominated. So when you win one, that's, that's it. crazy. That's, that's crazy. all, dog. That's how, that's how you get introduced the rest of your life. 
You know what I mean? You get, you know, you get congratulated on your Grammy forever. F- forever. Yeah. You get congratulated for. I'll be congratulated for my CMAs until next year. Somebody else wins one. You know what I mean? Like you, you're congratulated as for your Grammy. People, congratulations on your Grammy. Twenty years after you won it, it's crazy. Your guys won it. Three Six Mafia won a Grammy, didn't they? No, they won an Academy Award. Oh, okay. Even crazier, oh, they won fuck. a fucking Oscar. That's yeah, crazy. For a hard out here for a pimp. That's, was that's that not awesome? Did you see dude? their speech? Yes, I did. I yeah, went and watched it again so the other day. Yeah. It made me so happy. <laughs> you know, you know they, you know they gave me one of my first chances. Little white, oxycontin, Xanax bar, yeah, yeah. Percocet, and lure tabs. Little white Juicy brought me Jay's down. Juicy talked to, about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Juicy's yeah. my boy, man. That's 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 my dude, man. Juicy and Paul, man. They have been in my corner from day one. So you, if you if you do win the Grammy, like, bro, please, I'm gonna do it too. But turn, I'm gonna get your number two, Salim, all y'all, but. I'm gonna send y'all some playlists with some old Three Six Mafia on it. Hell yeah, and some UGK. Like next time you're working out, just trust me. Just okay. bang. You might not love it all, but it, it'd be cool for you to familiarize yourself with that era okay. of Southern hip hop. It was it was true. It was out. It was the outcast. Well, it slaps them this weekend too. Yeah. For, oh, dude. Well, bang. Yeah. I'll show you so much music, dog. Yeah. It's fucking. I'm like my mom. I'll play records all night. We got ourselves into a Nashville thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't this great? <laughs> Let's go. I think this was fucking great. Dude, was it good that dude, I bombed? Dude, it was amazing. I was high. Y'all dude, got me high was, nervous. It was one of our best Are your episodes. fans going to hate me? No. no they're oh, going to fucking dude, love you, bro. So it's, it's, just, it's just, yeah, it's such amazing. a fucking, it's dope to sit down yeah. and just chat with you, And bro. I want to get in front of your fans because I'm a fan. And I know I've said that a few times, but it's real. And it's like, sometimes you want to, that's how I got with Bert, which, in, you know what I mean? Like with Brennan Schaub and then I'm like, I was just a fan. And Theo and all these cool guys that have came into my life. And I always felt like if I could get on that podcast, their fans would get me because I am their fan to a yeah, degree. Yeah, like, sure. I represent a slice of their fan mm-hmm. base. And right. I don't know. That's what was that's cool about cool, this. Bro. Thank y'all yeah, for the I opportunity. You, bro. You're Man, a huge inspiration, Thank you for coming bro. on. Thank yeah, you. I think I we're going to be fucking, Honestly. we're going to be boys for a boys long time. Boys friends like said, forever, bro. dog. You're Nashville? stuck now. Let's do some yeah, country Nashville, shit. Nashville, motherfucker. Nashville. Come on, Well, especially after we drink together, then it's... Yeah, we'll write a song. Let's do it. We'll have a drink and write a song. Just no dark down. Grab a cold one. We'll write We'll write a fucking Nelk Boy song for the YouTube channel. We should do that. We are going to do that with Wiz, too. Yeah, we'll do it with Wiz. Let's call Wiz and tell him to out there Let's get on the mic and record it, though. No, I'm talking... Dog, we'll get on the mic and record it, but I mean, like, we should call Wiz right now and be like, yo, fucking meet her. I bet he'll come. I bet if I call Wiz right now and go, if you're off Saturday, come to Nashville, we're going out with the Nelk Boys. I bet Wiz will be like, fuck it. Yeah, he might come. Wiz don't care. Nah, He's we did him like awesome. th- three weeks ago. He was in. Yeah, no, he don't care. We're going to make a fucking he power wanted, track. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to call it Dry Streak. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> Steiner's on, dry, on a Dry Streak. Yeah. By choice. So that's like, well, it's and we're all, we'll all have a different yeah. experience of the Dry Streak. Like, could be funny. Dope. Love y'all boys, man. Yeah, Thank yeah, y'all. All right, all right, right, thank you. Peace, boys. All right, boys, just want to let you know real quick, we are available now officially at Walmart in California, Texas, and Florida. And then March 1st, we're going to be in over 3,000 Walmarts nationwide. So this is fucking huge news for Happy Dad. So if you guys have a Walmart near you, go to happydad.com slash find. Go and pick one up. I'm going to go fucking grab some right now. Got some Happy Mom. Nice and cold. In case the Happy Mom try to pick up a milk later. All right, boys, we're gonna grab these. Make sure you hit your local Walmart, grab a case of Happy Dad. We're also available at Fountain Blue in Miami and Jensen's Liquor in Miami as well. So hit those two spots for Happy Dad as well. Happy Dad's in Walmart, baby, let's go.